Tick tock, time to rock. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon to everyone who's watching from all around the world. I'm your friendly neighborhood philosopher, David Wood, and with me now is the legendary Jay Smith. Jay, how are you doing? Well, pretty good. Thanks, David. Good to be here with you. Finally, I've never been on your show before. This is the first time, I think. No, it's it's strange. I'm act I'm actually bad about getting people on the first time. Then it's uh then it's much easier. Um, so, <laughs> uh, yeah, Jay, why don't you uh like uh, those of us who are in apologetics dealing with Islam, and those of us who uh, watch YouTube videos are all familiar with the work that you've done. But for anyone who's kind of new to this or new to the channel and who hasn't been following what's been going on over the past uh, couple of decades of Islamic apologetics, why don't you tell everyone a little bit about what you've been doing over the years and a little bit about your background before we jump into the topic. Okay, I think I'm the granddad of all the ones who've been on YouTube. I've been on YouTube now since 2006. So what's that, 14 years? Uh, I think YouTube began in 2005. You were so. you were you were one of the OGs. You were one of the guys who saw how important it was back in the day because I remember your videos and it would be kind of in random places. You'd be like standing on a hill or something like that talking about uh talking about the, you know, te uh, problems with the Quran and so on. No, that was the latter, David, but you were there with us. I think you came down to see No, no, morning. I will find it. I will find. I saw oh, pictures you're talking of you about on... before the latter. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, that was back in London, back in 2006, and we were unpacking, looking at this kind of material. And in fact, some of the stuff we're talking about tonight will be very similar to what we were talking about way back in the goodness sakes, it seems like a century ago. But I've been doing this for about 40 years now, not YouTube, but uh, engaging with Islam since the early 1980s. Now, you can see my gray hair. That makes me the granddad of all of you. But uh, it's fascinating. I don't think I've had it this easy as I have it right now. We've never had it this easy, in fact, in just the last week and a half. Mm -hmm. We've had a real breakthrough, a real crack in the dam. For all the years that I've been working, and I've done most of my work in, uh, of course, I grew up in India. I'm a missionary kid, and so my father were missionary, my grandparents are missionaries. So I've come from that part of the world. I've come from the Indian subcontinent, surrounded by Muslims my whole life. We have about a 200 million Muslims there in northern India. And so having grown up with them, I do not fear them. I do. In fact, I engage with them. I've uh, certainly I've had roommates that were Muslims. I've had classmates that were Muslims. I remember we were having these discussions when I was knee high to a grasshopper. But because I left them in, uh, back in 1971. It was um, when I was came to the States to do my undergraduate and postgraduate that I finally got my first degree in apologetics, but not Islamic apologetics. There was no such thing back then in the 1980s. And so I went to Fuller Seminary and got another master's, and that was on Islam. But still, not apologetics and not... And of course, the word polemics wasn't even known. We didn't have a word like that. It was only when I left and went to Africa with my wife that we started coming across this material that, uh, that was fascinating to me. Uh, we were there for about five years, and then we were asked to go to London. And in 1992, we went to London. And one of the first things I did was go down to Speaker's Corner. Now, Dave, you've been there, haven't mm -hmm. you? You know what yep. it's like. Yep, a couple times. It's volatile. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's the bastion of freedom of speech. It's the only place on earth where you can say anything you want. There's only two laws. One is you may not slag off the queen, and you may not use any violence, which are both broken every week. But you can, this is the one place where we can take on Islam. But no one was doing that back in 1992. And for the 1990s, that whole eight years that I was there in the 1990s, I was really the only one that was confronting Islam all alone. And boy, I got beat up. I mean physically beat up. We would get my glasses broken. I, we got punched quite a bit. It was a very violent environment. Uh, there were many different... We would have ladders, these little kitchen ladders that you just stand on so you get your head above the crowd. I wasn't on those ladders. I was on the ground to begin with. Because we're not taught how to do that in homiletics class. We're not taught how to engage on a ladder and to confront those in, in front of us. Because we're told to be nice and pristine and timid and shy and Christ-like uh, with, you know, blonde hair and blue eyes. And we've always been, uh, that's all that I've ever grown up with, with that kind of engagement. Nothing about going toe-to-toe -to -toe with these guys and these gals, and especially these guys coming from the Indian subcontinent, because the majority of Muslims in London, now remember, we have a million Muslims living in London, and the majority of them come from three countries, Pakistan, India, and Bangladesh. Well, that's where I grew up, so I felt right at home with these guys. And it was fascinating because I kept on hearing things. I, I would go down to the corner and I would find them, they were attacking this book, the Bible, all the time. They never had Qurans in their hands. They never had Qurans. They had Bibles in their hands with little post-it notes all the way through. 
every one of these post-it notes was either a seeming contradiction or a seeming error or a seeming scientific uh, anachronism, and they would be th attacking me, and I'd never heard these kinds of attacks before. I thought I knew everything. I'd already studied under Dr. Dudley Woodbury there at Fuller Seminary. I thought I knew all the answers, but I hadn't heard these kind of questions. And, of course, I knew all about the the whole premise of the Quran. Of course, they had always been saying the same thing about this book, their book. But at that time, there was no th nothing to fall back on. There was nothing to really give us any material to confront the Quran. That's called polemics. There was no school, no class. I had never ever even come across anybody that knew how to confront the Quran or Muhammad in a public context, to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with them and have in a two-minute soundbite. <clears throat> so Speaker's Corner kind of formed us, and Speaker's Corner c created what we're now doing today. Then 9-11 happened. 9-11 changed everything. And suddenly the narrative was not one of violence, it was now one of peace. Mm. And Islam overnight became a religion of peace, which made my job a lot easier. Because now I didn't have to worry about protecting myself physically. I was on a ladder by that time because back in 1994, I got beat up pretty bad, knocked unconscious, and the police had to rescue me. Uh, and then when they pulled me out, uh, they said there were about 60 Muslims that had been kicking me on the ground. And they were concerned for my health. They were concerned for my safety. So they said, from here on out, you must stay on a ladder so we can see you. So that's why I started getting on a ladder. And in 1995, I started introducing material against the Quran. I was uh, taking classes from Dr. Gerald Hotting. I don't know if you know that name. Uh, he is one of the uh, revisionists. He is mm. uh, one of the scholars that studied under Dr. John Wansborough, uh, also uh, along with uh, David Cook and also along with Patricia Kroner. They're at School of Oriental and African mm -hmm. Studies. And I was taking occasional courses there. I didn't need another, another master's. I just wanted to sit in on his classes. And I was hearing things that I never heard before. This is back in 1994 and 1995. I was hearing things that all the Qiblas of the earliest mosques None of them were facing Mecca, things like this, that the Dome of the Rock didn't have a Qibla on it. And that it was, if it did, it certainly wasn't facing Pe uh, Mecca. It was facing somewhere much, uh, uh, much uh, further north. And then I was hearing things that all the, all the, everything we know about the Quran, everything we know about this preserved text doesn't come from the 7th century. It all starts to appear in after 690, after Abdul Malik, and that most of everything we know about this man Muhammad was first introduced in 833, yet he died in 632, and that everything we've heard about how the Quran was put together comes from two pages in a book called Al-Buhari, Sahih Buhari, volume 6, hadith number 509 and 510. And these are, they, though I'd heard these in the background, David, I never really, really engaged with them. Well, I start taking this stuff down to Speaker's Corner. And that's why I got beat up so much, because they had never heard this stuff. Mm. They didn't know this material. This was new to them. And so but it was about 1995, some of the disciples of, um, what's his name? I can't remember his name right now. Uh, he is from Halifax. He's the Muslim uh, Egyptian guy. Shabir, uh, not Shabir Ali. He was, a, he was one that taught Shabir Ali. Anyways, uh, okay, Jamal Badawi? Jamal Badawi. One of some of his disciples came to me and says, would you be willing to do a debate with this Dr. Jamal Badawi? He's on his way back from Malaysia. And I said, well, let's do it. Okay, 1990. So this is 1995. This was August 1995 at Cambridge University. And so I did my very first debate with him, and I gave 10 historical challenges amongst what we're, we're going to talk tonight about. So that was in 1995. And he didn't have really any response to any of these challenges. He had not really heard these challenges. All of these challenges I had got from Patricia Croner. She was there at Cambridge at that time, and she, I went with her the, next, the week before, and we sat in her office, and she helped me really put together my debate. So it was fascinating to me that the, someone of his stature, of his ability, probably one of the best, certainly uh, the, one of the best Muslim polemicists at that time, and certainly one of the best Quranic apologists in the English language, could not answer these questions. Now, we didn't talk about Kira'at so much at that time. We were talking more about manuscript evidence. But he didn't have any response to these problems, these geographical problems, the problem with Mecca. He didn't have any response to this idea that there was no reference to Mecca until 741, until the mid 8th century. If this is the place where, you know, where Abraham lived, if this is the place where Adam and Eve were sent to, if this is the place where Muhammad was born and grew up and where he moved from in 622 up into Medina, why is it that we have no reference to this place at all until the mid 8th century, 100 years later? These kind of questions he didn't have a response for. And that showed me at that time, my goodness, we've got a treasure trove here. We've got some material here that we need to work on. We've got some material here that we need to start introducing to the world. So that was way back in 1995. Well, this is 25 years later, and we're still working on it. But we've never really had the kind of response like we had this last week. 
And this was a gift. You were talking to me a little bit before the show, and you said, you know, you couldn't have asked for a better gift than what was done with that interview back yeah, on, 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 uh, on June 8. On, on, a scale, on a scale of 1 to 10, how much are we loving? How much are we loving Sheikh Yasser Qadi and Mohammed Hijab right now? Yeah, well, this is, this, this is what's fascinating, David. I mean, these good guys couldn't have really set it up for us better than what they have done. Because th what we saw last week, we're talking about on um, today's now the 19th, so we're talking about the 8th, we're talking about 11 days ago. 11 days ago, we saw two different sides of Islam. We saw two different worlds of Islam. Mm -hmm. We saw two different paradigms of Islam colliding. And what a collision it was. And I think this is what the Muslims need to hear. You've got a real problem here. Because if you have your, your cleric over here, I mean, if you have your academic, let's put him over here in the West. He says, and he claimed that, didn't he, within, within the talk. He talked about himself being an academic. And he mm -hmm. is. No doubt about it. God, well, well respected here in the United States and around the world. Coming from Houston. Has grown up here has an American accent. And what's more, he has gone and done what an academic should do. He's done his master's degree. He's got a PhD from Yale University, one of the best universities in the world, on this very material. Mm -hmm. And here he was, that happened 25 years ago. And here he was talking to Muhammad Hijab on this side. Muhammad Hijab, I would suggest, represents about 99% of the Muslim world, the, what we call the traditional Islam. This is the orthodox Islam. This is the classical Islam. This is the Islam that never asks any questions any deeper than you just memorize, you mm -hmm. just obey. On this side over here, this guy over here, he has to, he has a completely different environment. He's grown up not in the traditional world, he's grown up in a very Western world. And so as that, and having gone to places like Yale, he has to ask and answer a whole different set of categories. And you saw those two worlds collide. And, and, and he, it was cool. It was cool because uh, Sheikh, Sheikh Yasser Khadi, he was actually trying to explain that to Hijab. He said, you know, when you're at the beginning level of, of knowledge, you're like, what is all this? Ah, Ruf, Kirat, what is all this stuff? I don't know what this is. And he said, then once you, once you start digging a little deeper, then you just sort of mindlessly accept what your teachers tell you and you just simply regurgitate what they tell you. And he says, but if you dig really deep and you start having to deal with, uh, with, the, with the criticisms of outsiders, then you, you, you realize you've got some problems here. And so he, it's funny that he's explaining that to Muhammad Hijab. He's explaining what's going on in this conversation. And, and for, for those of you who didn't see it, I, I encourage you to watch it before it's no longer available. Hijab took that portion of the discussion off of his channel. Um, Yasser Qadi still has it on his channel as of this moment, but he took down the comments section. Uh, so it's still up there right now. And uh, we'll be talking about this in, here, here in a few, but uh, he's, he's actually filing copyright claims against people who are who are sharing the footage. So I had a copyright takedown. I'm going to win it. I'm going to win it. But that just shows you what, what kind of panic mode that he's in right now. But in effect, what you've got, ladies and gentlemen, is Muhammad Hijab really seems to believe that you know there's only one quran and even if even if you had to start over from scratch you could still put together the the, the perfect quran that goes back to the time of muhammad he really seems to believe that and he seems to believe that that's what yasser Qadi's going to say right if he just pushes him hard <laughs> enough that's what that's what's going to come out he's he basically thinks everyone has just misunderstood yasser Qadi, and so he keeps pushing him and yasser Qadi's going i don't want to talk about this in hijab well let me follow this up and yasser Qadi, i don't want to talk about this we should not be having this discussion in public and yasser Qadi keeps like it's it's almost like yasser Qadi the entire time was saying how much clearer can I make this to you, Muhammad Hijab? This is a bad idea. We should not be having this conversation right here. Stop this. I'm begging you, please stop. And Hijab, okay, well, let me let me push a little harder then. And so Hijab, and then <laughs> and then what happens afterwards? They're both they're both in they're both in panic mode. They're 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 both in massive damage control mode. They're both deleting stuff. Yasser Qadi was right. Yasser Qadi was right. This this would be disastrous to say this in public. And Hijab just kept pushing. And now it's kind of too late. All right, Jay, where were you? Uh, 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 I, I, I did. Oh, go Before ahead. we get into the interview, I want to show you why Muhammad Hijab had to ask this question. This is not something that's just come in the last few days. This is ha this actually began about four years ago. And I sent you the clip, and I'd like you to put up the clip if you could. Look and see. Now, before we put the clip up, I want to give some background to it. And I, I don't know if all, if all of you know who uh, Hatun Tash is. If you don't know, get to know her. Uh, this is a real warrior of God. And I have never 
been have more privilege than working with this lady. This lady is absolutely amazing. Uh, she's from Turkey. Uh, she used to be a Muslim. She now lives in London. And I've known her for about eight, eight or nine years now. Uh, I got to know her because I was teaching her in Oxford at the OCA Center of Apologetics there. And uh, she was my student, and she thought I was very arrogant, which a lot of people think I am because of the way I come across. And so I remember that while I was in, in, one of our co- in one of our talks there, I said, listen, I'm down at a place called Speaker's Corner every Sunday. If any of you want to come down and join me, uh, you'll have a great time down there. So she came down and never stopped coming. I mean, she got hooked the first Sunday she was there, and she's still down there. Now it's locked down, of course. We're in pandemic, so she's not there uh, these Sundays. But when she started coming down, uh, we got we had we brought her on to Fander, and so she was a member of Fander, which is our organization. And uh, she was went to a did a trip down to Morocco. She went down to Morocco to do a trip there to do some teaching, and she needed to get a Quran. So she just walked into the first bookstore she could find there in the marketplace and asked them if she could have a Quran. And they said, "Well, which Quran do you want?" She says, what do you mean? Just any crime. Well, the, well which one? Do you want Huffs? you want Warsh? And they says, what do you mean Huffs and Warsh? I, I thought there was only one Quran. They said, oh, no, there's quite a few different ones we have about. I don't know, remember. I don't know the whole dialogue, but he said, well, there are numerous ones that we have here. She says, well, give me, give me the first one you have. What's the most popular one here in North Africa? And they said, here, the Warsh. So she took the Warsh, and she came home back to London. And then she, she now listen, this woman doesn't even speak Arabic. She's not Arab. She's Turkish. She's never had Arabic. But all she needed to do was put the two Qurans side by side. And then she just went from page to page, and she just compared what the two Arabic words said. And she saw, well, this word looks different than this word, or this phrase looks different than that phrase. And so she circled them, and then she went back to her Arab friend, and she went back to her Arab friends there in London and says, is this the same? She said, no, that's different. No, that says different. And they would translate to her what the difference says. And then she realized these are completely different words. These are completely different verses. These are completely different meanings. In some cases, these are completely different theologies. And she came to me about it and says, yes, well, I do this. We heard this in seminary. I remember hearing this under Dudley Woodbury that this was a problem. But I had never really done what she had done. And really, no one had really done in our experience. I didn't really come across who did, uh, to who had someone who had done it. So she started sending out the message to all her friends all over the North Africa and uh, in Morocco and Yemen and Jordan to ask them to bring back, go to the local bookstore and look. And she started getting all the different names. So she got, she said, I want Nafi. I want Ibn Kathir. I I want Abu Binir, I want Ibn Amir, I want Asim, uh, Ibn Ali, Abi al Najud. I want Hamza al Zaklat, I'm looking for Al Kisai, uh, I want Abu al Jafar, I want Yal Yaqub, Al Yamami, and I want Khalaf. Those are the ten major ones. She wanted to look for those ten major ones. And uh, then she started getting them. People start, they only cost a few dollars. You can buy them in all these bookstores. These are not in the Nile River like what the Muslims thought they would. They were, they, the ones that were in Cairo were thrown into the Nile. You cannot get rid of these Qurans just by throwing them into the Nile back in 1924. And so she came across 10 of them, but she didn't stop there. Then start, she started getting ones named Kaloon and Al-Bazi and Al-Duri. Not just one Al-Duri, two Al-Duris. And then she finally came across, and she'd already had the Warsh, and she had the Kunbul. And by the time 2015 rolled around, 2016, she had 26 of these different Qurans. 26 of these different Qurans. And she was giving them to all her Arab friends, as many as she could. And they were looking and they were finding all these differences. And they were finding not a few differences, they were finding hundreds. Not a hundreds, thousands of differences. So we suggested, we talked about it, and I said, why don't we take these down to Speaker's Corner? Let's just hold them up. Let's just go and see what would happen if we took these Qurans down to Speaker's Corner and held them up for people to see. So this is in 2016. Look what happened. And take a look and see who's there. I want you to look carefully to see if you see somebody you're going to recognize. Go Uh, ahead. All right, here we go. Speaker's Corner 2016, ladies and gentlemen. There is only one Quran, right? And that every Quran in the world is the same. That's what you've been told. You have been told a lie! You run away from two. Okay, so there are two Qurans today, right? Two. More than two Qurans. More than two, three Qurans. More than three, four Qurans. There are approximately 26 of the Qurans. 26 different Qurans.
the, the prophets fought, but by the time you get to the they were killed. Welcome, Anna, Anna. That is a huge thing. Anna, your faces, Muslim people, your faces, come here. Come, 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 come. You go. We're going to make it more and more difficult for you. Uh, did ev did everyone catch the uh, the Muslims there at the end calling everyone away from those twenty six Qurans? Everyone, back up Who because was the tall man there. Who was it? Do you recognize him, David? That was the mighty Muhammad Hijab. He looks a lot thinner then, doesn't he? Yeah, destroyer of destroyer of Yasser Qadi's career. <laughs> <laughs> that was him in that crowd, and he was the one pulling all the Muslims away. Mm -hmm. And I, I've known Muhammad Hijab all that time, and we've known him for quite a few years. And uh, he is about six foot five, maybe six foot eight. He, he, uh, yeah, he, he's got. I'm I'm six foot three, and he was towering several inches above me. So he is he is in the six six seven six foot eight range. He's a he's a well, giant. When he comes and takes me on. I'm on the ladder, he's on the ground, and his face is right next to mine. I mean, that's it. He doesn't need a ladder. And we've done a few debates there. If you go up on Fander Films, you will see a debate that he hide, and I did, and he's just sitting there going like this, doing, put, showing his muscles. He could, he, that's about all he could do in that debate. It was on this very material. It was on this very thing that we're talking about right now. So that was in 2016. We went down three different times with those Qurans and held them up. The last time we went down there, we almost didn't leave the corridor. They were so upset with us. They did not want us to leave with those Qur'an. They tried to grab our bag. They broke the handle. The young, some of the young men followed us and were trying to get in the way from us leaving the corner. It was such a, it was such a catharsis for them. They had never come across this before. And I, as I looked at these young men, you could see that they were having panic. They were having a crisis. And I suggest that Muhammad Hijab was in panic mode as well. He was having a crisis. And he has still been in crisis for four years. And that's why I think, I can't prove it, but I think that's why he wanted Yasser Qadi to put this to rest. Because mm -hmm. four years now, no one has been able to answer the question that he couldn't answer back then in 2016. Mm -hmm. He had to pull them out of the crowd. He had to say, come to me, come to me. What would he have sold them? Mm -hmm. What would he have showed them? You notice they tried to pull the papers from our hands mm -hmm. where we were giving side by side, side by side, the huffs and the wash, the huffs and the kaloon, the huffs in the kunbal. We were just showing differences, huge differences. We had about 70 out of... Now, listen, since that time, Hatun and her team have found 93,000 differences. 93,000 differences. She now has 37 of these different Qurans. There are 30 that are considered to be uh, standard, or there are 30 that are, that are now supposedly are the standard 10. You have the 10, which are the readers, and they are Nafi and Ibn Kathir and Abu Amir and Ibn Abi al-Dimashq and Asim Ibn Abi, excuse me for my pronunciation, Hamza al-Zalyat and al-Kisa and Abu Jafar and Yaqub al-Yamami and also Khalif. Khalif. Those are the 10. Those are the 10 major ones. The first seven plus the other three. The first seven that Ibn Mujahid canonized in 936. Look at the date, 936. This is the 10th century. So those are the first seven that were canonized by by uh, Abi Mujahid. Now, Ibn Mujahid. Now, another three were then added by al-Jazari, and he died in uh, 1429. So you're talking the 15th century. Another three were added. But with each one of these ten, there are two narrators or two transmitters. And it's the two transmitters, which makes another 20, that gives you 30. So that's how you get 30 of these Qira'at. Not one, not two, but 30 of them. Where is Hafs in all this? And who is Hafs? We might want to come back to that at another time. But you can then understand why our good friend, Mohammed Hijab, had to ask this question a week ago. He was having this problem back in 2016, mm -hmm. and he was hoping, and he was really hoping, that our Yasser Qadi, who is a world-renowned scholar who has a PhD in the Quran, has uh, done all this work, is well-known all over the Internet, has an enormous amount of following in the Internet, not as f big as you, but certainly in the Muslim world, he is one of the best. And mm -hmm. he wanted to come and ask this question, a simple question. And, 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 and by, by the way, this is, uh, this is very common uh, amongst Muslims, that they think that, well, even if I couldn't answer this question, my, my leader could. Or a a scholar could right that that is their at that is their attitude that was always like like even way back when I was talking to Beal that was his attitude even if he would get stumped I do not know how to answer that he would have complete confidence that there is a solution 
that if he just gets the right Muslim scholar to uh, to ask him about it, then he can he can uh, he can he can fix those doubts. And uh, it, it, on, on on this issue right here, because you, you posted that was posted back in 2016, I posted a clip of you guys showing uh, the 26 Qurans back then, and it had like uh, it got like 1.2 million views. Uh, on my channel, but watching the Muslim responses, it was all, it, the first response is, guys, you're so stupid, those are different translations. And I got that from hundreds of Muslims sending me messages, Th you idiot, those are different translations. So you have to explain, no, those are different Arabic Qurans. And then the next response is, oh, but those are just differences in pronunciation. And you gotta, no, there are actually differences in the text. And then the response is, uh, no, these are just for different dialects. And you, no, there's something else, right? And they're, they're going down the list. And then it's, well, why don't you debate Zucker Nike on this issue or something like that, right? They, they really believe that if you get the right guy, if you get the right Muslim scholar and sit him down, he can clarify all this and show you that your, 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 your doubts are, are silly. Right, and so you're you're right. Muhammad Hijab. So this Muhammad Hijab you, gets yeah. Muhammad Hijab gets Sheikh Yasser Qadi and Sheikh Qadi. We're gonna ask you, and you're gonna fix you go. all these problems. And all of a sudden, Hijab has to realize, whoa, this is not going the way I I, I wanted it to. And are we gonna play any clips? Are we gonna look at them? Or are, we can are look, look at some clips. We can look at some clips. Maybe why don't we just look at some clips and then unpack what's going on here? Because there's, it's amazing, not just the body language, but what he is saying. And he's saying an awful lot more than he should have said, because you and I know that this is going on in the Muslim world. But the vast majority of those who are watching this will not see this. You will probably not even pick it up. But you will need to understand, you need to see that this is a real clash. But this was also a, such a clash that you can see that, that Yasser Qadi is struggling is struggling to shut this down as david said earlier he's struggling to shut this down because he doesn't want to take it and what does he do all the way through just take my class just take my class mm -hmm. i can't tell you now i can't do it into the camera but if you take my class everything will be explained so let's go show some of these clips yeah and let's see exactly what how they exactly how they dealt with this material and that this very that was the the main complaint because you had the Muslims who are saying, "Hey, you're you're shaking my faith here. You're shaking my faith." You had the Muslims who are saying that, but then even the Muslims who weren't saying that said, in effect, Yasser Qadi, you raised all these doubts and said there are all these problems, and then you offered no solution to any of the problems. So you just left people with doubts and problems. That's all you did. Why did you say anything? Because he could he could have just said. I don't want to talk about this and not said anything, but he says uh, he says a lot more than that. So uh, this is actually still um, I, I, I would have played my own compilation, but unfortunately, Sheikh Yasser Qadi had it removed. He might have this video removed through copyright uh, takedown for just posting these clips. I don't know. He seems to be uh, he seems to be on a rampage to remove content. But this is actually the, the first video. Um, that uh, that sort of brought this to everyone's attention from Islam critiqued. Uh, from the, the Islam Critiqued YouTube channel, and he posted a short compilation of these clips. We'll watch probably half of it, then 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 stop it for uh, to discuss it a little bit, and then we'll we'll watch the rest. So, all right, here we go. Let's see uh, Muhammad Hijab interviewing Sheikh Yasser Qadi. Every single student of knowledge knows who studies Ulum al Quran that the most difficult topics are Ahruf al Qiraat and the concept of Ahruf and the reality of Ahruf and the relationship of the Rathmatic Mus'haf with the Ahruf and the preservation of the Ahruf. Is it one? Is it three? Is it seven? And the relationship of the Qira'at to the Ahruf. This is a topic that when you're the beginning, beginning student of knowledge, you're like, what is all of this going on here? When you go a little bit more, you learn to simply memorize what your teachers say and regurgitate it out. And you don't fully comprehend. When you do a deep dive is when things get very, very awkward and difficult. And this isn't new. This is from the time of the Sahaba. This is not a joke, brothers and sisters. The issue of Ahruf and Qiraat caused confusion to somebody whom the Prophet ﷺ said, if you want to listen to the Quran directly, listen to Ubay. Ubay is not some even average Sahabi. He is the Qari of the Quran. He is the master. He is who he is. And he goes, Fadakhal fi nafsi shak. Like, what is all of this stuff? Um, again, this is the you, you have asked me some very honest questions. It's the first time I'm saying these things. Many people are aware who listen to my lectures that I've mentioned the crises that happened to me at Yale. This was the issue. That the issue of ahruf and preservation and qiraat and relationships between them, 
these are very, very difficult issues. And the most advanced of our scholars, they're not quite fully certain how to solve all of the unanswered questions in there. Here's the point. These issues should only be discussed amongst people who know what the Qiraat are and who understand some of these questions that are being so, raised. So is what you're saying, the shek that came, or not the shek, but the, the, the crisis that you... That's a good. That's a good spot to um, uh, pause it right there, and then we'll go back and continue. But uh, yep, I I do not believe that was the answer. <laughs> that Muhammad Hijab was expecting. Could you go ahead and explain this to us? Yes, of course I can. There's only one Quran, perfectly preserved, right down to the letter. And yeah, there are the you know Ahruf, and those are just some different dialects. So that's not a problem. And eh, basically, there's no problem whatsoever here. One Quran. Perfectly preserved, something along those lines. And uh, Sheikh Yasser Qadi uh, just didn't go there. We, again, we, we, have, uh, we have plenty more from Sheikh Yasser Qadi. But uh, uh, Jay, what, do you, what, what would you like to say about what you just heard from Sheikh Yasser Qadi? Yeah, uh, this is fascinating because what you're hearing Qadi say, this is the most difficult issue for us to, uh, to have to deal with. And what he's talking about, you have to go back to these two different uh, uh, this is uh, from Al-Buhari, volume 6, 509, and Al-Buhari, volume 6, 510. So there's two different hadith here from two different periods. This is what happens to the Quran. This is how this explains how the Quran was put together in 632. So this is the Abu Bakr Quran. And this is the one that explains how the Quran was then redone in 652, roughly 20 years later under Uthman. So this is Abu Bakr, this is Uthman, two pages apart. And this is what all Muslims have to go to to know how the Quran was compiled. And what Yasser Qadi is saying, when you go back here, you will notice that at the very beginning, Muhammad had died. He died in 632. The Quran had not yet been compiled. There was no Quran. It had been memorized by many of the Sahaba, and there was parts of it that had been put on stone, bone, and pieces of bark, and things like that. But it had not been written in any codified form. In 632 to 633, there was a battle called the Battle of Yamama, when about 70 of those who had memorized it were killed. And so this became a crisis for Abu Bakr and Umar. Abu Bakr was the caliph at that time. And they realized that if any more people died, they would not have any Quran for them to go on, because you need to have people who had memorized it to retain it, to preserve it. So they called Zaidi bin Thabit. Now, David, who is Zaidi bin Thabit? Well, he's the secretary of Muhammad, mm -hmm. right? That's that's the man. Oh, but by the by the way, I, I wanted to just give you a, I wanted to just give a quotation on that, just in case anyone's doubting what you what you just said about the people uh, dying in battle. Uh, this is I'll give the quotation here, and then Jake can continue. Ibn Abi Dawud's Kitab al Masahif. Uh, many of the passages of the Quran that were sent down were known by those who died on the day of Yamama, but they were not known by those who survived them, nor were they written down, nor had Abu Bakr, Umar, or Uthman by that time collected the Quran, nor were they found with even one person after them. Now, now Muslims, uh, do, 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 you, do you realize what they just said? Many of the passages of the Quran that were sent down, so sent down through Muhammad, were known by those who died on the day of Yamama. So they, they were known by the people who died in battle, but they were not known by those who survived them. They weren't known by anyone who survived, nor were they written down. So they hadn't been written down and no one had the, uh, and, and there was no one alive who had them memorized. Now, guess what? If no one alive had them memorized and they weren't written down, what's that mean? It means they're gone. It means they're gone, right? Nor had Abu Bakr, Umar, or Uthman by that time collected the Quran. Quran had not been collected yet. Nor were they found with even one person after them. Now, guys, just think about how amazing it is when you run up to us and you say, perfect preservation, right down to the letter from the time it was revealed to Muhammad. And then we start going through your sources and we found stuff like this. Yep, passages were lost. Passages were lost. And what are you Muslims going to say? Nope, everyone had, oh, there were hundreds of people who had it memorized. It couldn't, it couldn't, it could have been lost. And we read this and it's like, you're telling us something completely different from what your sources say. Your sources say very clearly, passages were lost. They were never found again. And Jay, isn't that, that's the, that's the basis for collecting the Quran into a book, right? Before yeah. that, they're thinking, before that, it seemed that 
before that, it seemed that, you know, writing these things down on like rocks and leaves and bone fragments was kind, was more like an aid to memory, right? Like you, you wanted to write something down on a leaf so that you could go back to your tent and memorize it, but they're focused on memorizing it and reciting it. And then it gets to the point where people are dying in battle and they're the only people who have passages memorized. Um, and wow, we don't have those. We don't have those passages written down anymore. We can't find that. We don't have a copy of those. Hey, we need a book form. So now it's, we need to change the emphasis to having this in an actual book so that as we die, we don't lose, we don't lose more. And the, the reason this is amazing is every Muslim tells me, well, it doesn't matter if you have all these different versions of the Quran and you have all these Quran <laughs> and so on, because there are so many millions of Muslims who have the Quran perfectly memorized. If you go back to the beginning, they seem to realize that is a really, really, really bad way of preserving a text. And so they said, look, we need one copy. One, co We need one copy right now. So Abu Bakr made sure they had one copy so that as people die, there's a, there's a Chinese proverb that, that says, uh, I think it's the, uh, the weakest ink will outlast the strongest memory. And uh, yeah. they had to find that out the hard way. Go ahead. And this is very, this is very, very great that you bring it up because there's an awful lot of Muslims that say, well, yes, they all memorized it. That's all they needed was the memorization. It's obvious to Abu Bakr and Umar that memory wasn't good enough. It's, this caused the crisis so much so, and we know that 70 were killed at the Battle of Yama. If just 70 dying caused this kind of crisis, mm -hmm. that they had to have it written down, that suggests that memory isn't good enough. And we all know that. Literally, that's a no, that's a no brainer. So here they have, back in 632, they put together this one copy. Uh, Zaid ibn Tabi does it all by himself. He gives it to Abu Bakr, who gives it to Umar, who gives it to his daughter, who is the widow of Muhammad. Her name is Hafsa. And what does she do with it? Well, she sticks it under her bed. <laughs> Rather a stupid idea to stick it under your bed. Why would you put it under your bed if this is the only copy you've got? If this is the one and only copy you've got, it stays there for 20 years. Let's now jump to this one here. And this is where, where Yasser Qadi and this is where Shabir Ali back on May 19th came apart. Because yes, this is not the first person that came up with a video. Shabir Ali came up with a video on May 19th where he tried to un help us unpack this part, mm -hmm. the Uthmanic recension, the second Quran. This is the now the second Quran. And there was a problem uh, by Hudaifa. Hudaifa says, listen, there's all these people in the Shams. Shams means the people in the north. Shams means the people in Syria and Iraq. Hold on to that. We're going to come back to that. These people who are up here in the north, they are not reciting it the same way. And we're going to have a problem like the Christians and Jews have. They're going to be, we're going to have many different books. Therefore, we need to get one final copy. So Uthman gets Zaid ibn Tabiq, wakes him up after 20 years, and he says, okay, I want to give you three other guys, Zubair, Alas, and Hadith, and the four of you are going to rewrite this Quran again, go and wake up Hafsa, get her copy, get it from under her bed, and then take that copy, and notice what he says next. You must write it in the Qureshi dialect. So here is a dialect called the Quraysh. What is the Quraysh dialect? This is the Quraysh dialect that Muhammad would have used. This is the dialect that he would have spoken in Mecca and Medina, the Hijaz, the central part of Arabia. Not the Shams, not Syria, not Iraq. This is supposed to be the Quraysh dialect of Mecca. Am I correct? Yep. Pretty obvious to me. Mm -hmm. Well, let me ask you this, David. How do you write a dialectical form? How do you write a dialect in a consonantal text? Because remember, the Arabic is only consonantal. It doesn't have any vowels. Those were added much, much later. The Dhamma, the Kasra, the Nafata. How do you write a consonantal text in a dialectical form if there's no dots? There were no dots in the 7th century. So what does this mean? Does this make any sense to you? Uh, no, no, never has. And uh, and I think that's what Shabir acknowledged at the, the story of, of the of the Ahruf. He says, uh, he says, yeah, this could refer to, to dialects and so on. But he says, but... Muslim scholars can't agree on what on what this means. That's the same thing uh, Sheikh Qadi says. Uh, even even going back to his book the, on the on the sciences of the Quran, that Muslims have all these different theories. And it, even in the interview with Hijab, there he said Muslims have all these theories, and some of them can explain more than others, but none of them can answer these press, pressing questions that are coming from outside the fold of Islam. But basically. No one, no one knows what they mean. That they have the, and, and matter of fact, this is a perfect example of what he's talking about when he says that here in Islam, we see an issue and we push a little bit, and then we give an and, and then when we get an answer, we say, okay, that that's good, that's good, that's good. He goes, the the non-Muslims, they don't have that red line. He says they just keep, they just line. yeah. We he haven't goes, come to that yet. Yeah. I was going to hold on to the red line because that's the best thing I've heard yet. But yeah. hold on, 
Let's don't let's don't jump on it because we that's going to come up in, mm -hmm. uh, in the next clip that you're going to yeah, show. And here, here, and here, I here I just I just mean that he's uh, he's he's breaking it down that. Uh, they will just keep asking questions. And so the, the Muslim the Muslim response is, a Muslim hears, oh no, there are these different ahruf? What is that? What could that be? And then the explanation comes, oh, you see, it's just differences. It's just differences in dialect. And your, the Muslim said, oh, okay, see, you know, that's good. That's good. Because, you know, I believe- That's all he needs. Uh, yeah, that's, that, that, that's good enough for me. And But if you were to bring that up in a non-Islamic context, they're going to push back. At, what are you talking about? They're going to say the stuff you're just saying. What, what, what are you on, talking about? On. Yeah, go ahead. You're jumping ahead and you're coming up with some of the- Sorry about that. Sorry about that. Choicest material that we're yet to cut, unpack. Mm -hmm. But let's hold off because we want to hear Cuddy say that. Because what Cuddy says is absolutely informative. Mm -hmm. But anyways, we're here we are. We're back and we're, they're saying, write it in the court. I'm making a point about this because you're going to see what and who Huffs is. You're going to see the one that they did chose is the wrong one, nonetheless. So they do this and they write it up and they get it finally in one codified form and then they send it out to all the provinces. Now, according to tradition, as long as I've been studying it, we've always been talked about only four cities, Basra, Baghdad, Damascus, and Medina. Those are the four. And we have four different people that became that were the reciters that actually were responsible. Ubay bin Kab. That's what he's talking about. He's remember he said Ubay bin Kab. Mm -hmm. Ubay. He was the best. He was up in Damascus. His was the best. You have Ibn Masud who is in Baghdad. You have Ibn Musa who is in Basra, and you have Zaid ibn Tabid who is in Medina. So those are the four men who go with the reciters who are the ones responsible for these different four different codices. But that's not what it says. In Sahih, it's not what it says in Sahih Bukhari. Read it again. It says to every province. There were more than four provinces. Let me name them. Basra, Baghdad, Damascus, Jerusalem, Cairo, Alexandria, Aden, Herat, and Nishapur. How many did I just do? That's nine. There were actually nine provinces. So whether it's four or nine, I would like to find that one, even one of those four. I would like to know where that one of those four that was in Basra, Baghdad, or in Damascus, or in uh, the, uh, in Medina. Give me even one of those four, because I would like to know exactly what was written there. What we do know is that immediately after he did this and sent them out to the provinces, he took all the remaining manuscripts. Hold on a minute. I thought these were recitations. Recitations aren't manuscripts. Recitation is something you do with your mouth. Recitation, a dialect, is how you pronounce it. You can read the text, the concept, that way you pronounce it different if you're in Morocco than the way you pronounce it in Cairo, and different than the way you do it in Jordan. And depending on where you are, what you see in the text and how you pronounce it are two different things. So how can you then take manuscripts and burn them? This is exactly what he did. He burned manuscripts, not people's tongues, not people's recitations. So that's where Shabir Ali got it completely wrong, because he was trying to say that these were recitations that were different. That's why they had to put it into one dialect. The difficulty even with that is there was no way that you could have it in a dialectical form in the 7th century. The dots had yet to be invented. Those were created in the early 8th century into the mid-8th century, canonized in the late 8th century. And once you had all these dots, once you had these dots above and below the lines, and there, remember, there are 28 letters in the Arab alphabet. Uh, there are about 15 that are unique, but there are oh, six that don't need any dots. All the other ones need dots to know what you're talking about. So if you have just one little curly face or smiley face, if you put a dot above it, it becomes a nut. Two dots above it, it becomes a ta. Three dots above it, it becomes a fa. One dot below it, it becomes a ba. Two dots a ya. Na, ta, fa, ba, ya. You can get five different letters just by putting the dots above and below the lines. Can you then understand that when you all of a sudden get a whole proliferation of these dots, then you have a proliferation of different words, do you not? And mm -hmm. that's why when you start getting the dots and start to make these dialectical differences, you're going to have many different variations on where those dots go. If you just take three little words, three letter letters together, not words, just three letters together and put dots above, the line, above and below the line, you can get anywhere from 19 to 33 words just from three letters put together. Can you then understand then why this became a real dilemma in the late 8th century? And why then they needed to find out where they're going to put these dots, how are they going to put the vowels, because then the da vowels were invented. That's the dama, the u sound. That's the fa the kasra, the e sound. That's the futta, that's the a sound. There are only three vowels, short vowels, and they're elongated as well. Those three vowels were there invented in the 8th, possibly the ninth century. Once they had the vowels in place, then you could put them all over the place, and you get many, many different variations. And that's where the problem with kira'at comes. The kira'at comes in which school, which reader, 
Which one are you going to follow? Which set of dots and, and vowels are you going to follow? And that's why we now have first seven, and then three more, which is 10, and then another 20, which makes 30, that were then came into existence by the time of the 15th century. But this is fascinating because what we have been told and what they all tell you is that this all happened in the time of Muhammad. Remember that story of Umar hearing the recitation of, from one guy that's different than what he had been told. He grabs him by the shirt and he drags him into Muhammad and he says, listen to him. And Muhammad listens to him. And Muhammad said, well, that's okay. That's fine. It's been, it's been given in seven ahruf, seven kira'at, seven different readings. That happened at the time of Uthman. I'm sorry, that happened at the time of Muhammad, right? Mm -hmm. Where do you get that story from? Who was the one that tells you that story? You, ha you have that in Bukhari, right? It's Al-Buhari yeah. that tells you that. And when did Al-Buhari die? He died in 870. So who was the one that canonized that viewpoint? That's Ibn Mujahid. He died in 936. So this story about Muhammad and what was going on in Muhammad's time about these different seven readings, that comes from the 9th and 10th century, redacted back onto the 7th century. David, do you know of any place in the 7th century where you can find this story? Um, no, but I don't know where we can find any stories. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> <Not early Islam. laughs> so everything we're going to hear from the Muslims, everything we're going to hear from Yasser Qadi, everything that Muhammad Hijab is dependent on is not from the 7th century. It's not even from the 8th century. It's all from the 9th and 10th century. Now let's ask yourself as a Christian, are you dependent on the, if you're going to take the same ca category for us as Christians, that means we would know nothing about Jesus Christ. We would know nothing about who Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John were until the 3rd century. How would you defend Jesus Christ or the crucifixion or the resurrection if you only had people that were first writing it down in the third and fourth century for that which is happening in the first century? We, How could we defend that? We don't, use, we don't use any third century sources. We only use first century sources. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Now, why is it that we haven't pushed this onto the Muslims? Everything they're going to tell us comes from the ninth and tenth century but nothing comes from the seventh and eighth century or the early eighth century. And that's why when Yasser Qadi says that this created him a crisis of faith, I don't think he has yet to know what the real crisis of faith is, that's coming for him. And that we're going to get later on when we bring someone else into the whole picture. But let's go ahead mm -hmm. and show the next picture, because the next picture, I, I, the next clip, I think is where we're really going to start unpacking the real problem that went on in that interview. Oh, real, 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 real quick before we, before we move on, uh, uh, Silent Noisy here said, uh, you are shaking my faith. But spelled shake, like a uh, shake, shake -E kind of shaking my faith. Anyway, I wanted to, I wanted to put this up before I forgot it because that would be a, that would be a funny title for a video or something like that. Shaking my faith, uh, given all the people who say their faith has been shaken uh, by Yasser Qadi's recent uh, admissions. But uh, I just wanted to bring in one thing uh, before we continue with the video. All along the lines of Uthman burning all of the manuscripts. Uh, guys, do you see? how Islam really hasn't changed down to the present time, right? Once they start realizing, wait a minute, we've got, we've got, all, these diff we've got all these differences in the way we're reciting the Quran and so on, and, and this is going to cause this, this, this huge crisis, and then you get down to the present time. So you're talking, talking almost 14 centuries later, Sheikh Yasser Qadi admits, guys, Come on, we need to get past, there's some problems, there's definitely some problems with our, our perfect preservation belief that many of you Muslims have. Once you start, once you start digging a little deeper, you find out you got some major problems and it's not really answering the questions. And what's the response from Islam? You need to delete that footage. You need to, you need to start blocking it. You're destroying everyone's faith. It's better to just, it's better to lie about it, and pretend that none of that is there so that you don't hurt our confidence. And just to show you how bad this is right now. Just to show you how bad this has gotten, this is. Uh, <laughs> I wanted to share this copyright. This copyright takedown here. So this is a uh, this is a copyright strike. And if you look, if you look towards the uh, towards the bottom left hand corner, you see uh, right under where it says strike on June nineteenth. So that's today. Strike on June nineteenth. Look, look, look right below that. Content removed by Yasser Qadi. Content removed by. Yasser Qadi. This is a copyright takedown because I was playing some clips from his video. Now, anyone, anyone who knows anything about how copyright works 
anyone who knows anything about how copyright works, you can take clips of people's material, especially, especially if you're using those clips uh, or quotations for the purpose of education or criticism, which is exactly what I was using those clips for. Uh, you can't just take like an, an entire lecture or something like that and post it yourself, uh, but you're allowed to use excerpts and to use clips, quotations, and so on. I mean, think, the way Yasser Qadi's, uh, the way Yasser Qadi's moving, if you simply quoted something he said in a paper or something like that, he could say, oh, that's my copyrighted material. No, in, in the, the West, people have always understood if you, if you were to, if you were to stop people, if you were to stop people from being able to respond to one another and take clips of, of other people and, and uh, you know, uh, quote people, if you were to stop that, you're basically shutting down open discussion of ideas. So they, they put the concept of fair use into law, meaning if you are using clip, you're not using the entire thing, you're using portions of it for purposes of, of uh, education and criticism and so on, you're allowed to do that all day. So notice, my that is exactly what my video was. This would be laughed out of court if it were brought into court. Sheikh Yasser Qadi, when you go to do this, they make sure you understand what is allowed and what is not allowed. So Sheikh Yasser Qadi knows that he is deliberately filing a false copyright complaint to get my material taken down temporarily because there's no way I would lose this, right? Eventually this, the video that was taken down, eventually that video will be back up. It's indisputable. It could be, you know, a couple weeks if he, if he agrees that his copyright, I mean, that his copyright complaint is bogus. It could be longer than that if he actually wants to go to court, in which case he's going to have to pay all my legal fees when he, when he loses and the judge laughs it out of court. Uh, but here's the point. He's so desperate to shut down me pointing out what he said that's all that video was it's me criticizing what he said me pointing out look look at all these things he just admitted and after the backlash he got from his own community from the muslim community you're destroying our faith he had to take that down you can go to his video now there are no more comments why because if you read through the comments i wish i'd screenshotted them i did not i, I should have anticipated him taking these comments down because Muslims in the comment section were saying things like, you are destroying my faith and you are going to have to answer before Allah on why you destroyed my faith on the judgment day. They were saying things like that. And so he just took down the comments to, so, so he wouldn't have to see these. But notice, I don't want to see all these comments. Block them. Uh, this guy's taking video clips to expose what I said, which is what you're supposed to do, right? This is what, this how, this how uh, open dialogue works. Uh, so no, I have to file a false copyright to get rid of that material. What is this? These guys, these guys are the modern day Uthmans. Muhammad Hijab, yes, these are the modern Uthmans burning all the evidence that exposes them. This is, these are, these are awesome times. As easy as it is to look at, look at something like that and get mad, once you understand what the panic, the fear that is underlying their actions right now, mm -hmm. the, the panic mode that they're in, the, the, the desperation in that community, Sheikh Yasser Qadi knowing that, wow, Muslims are attacking me, uh, and 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 unbelievers are using it to to destroy people's faith in the Quran. I have to silence all this. And notice, there was only one way out of this. Once he said all that stuff in Muhammad Hijab's um, uh, interview, there was one way forward for Yasser Qadi for him to say, "Okay, I said, you know, it's a long discussion. You really have to understand. So I'm going to post a 20-hour series going through all this to help everyone understand, and then you'll understand why." Uh, we can still believe the Quran is the word of God, even though it has all these has all these problems. But he doesn't want to do that. Why? Because he still does not want Muslims to know about those problems. And so there's no way out. And now they're in lockdown mode. We need to lock all this stuff down. They're going to scramble. They're going to get, I mean, Hatun is facing, uh, has multiple copyright strikes against her channel from Adnan Rashid, from playing clips by him. They're all using the same method. They're all filing fake copyright claims, uh, hate speech claims. They're all, they're all doing it. Why? because they are in the tradition of Uthman, where you destroy the evidence, hide the evidence, instead of actually dealing with the evidence. Anything you wanted to add, Jay, before we uh, yeah. watch some more? We, we, we've, we haven't said what the whole problem is. Why is it that they are so concerned with preserving the text? And it has nothing to do with a desire on their part. It has nothing to do with something that's come out in the modern day. This has to do with the Quran itself. The Quran makes that claim. In chapter 85, verse 22, it's very clear that the Quran itself are 
from are de derived from the preserved tablets. These are the eternal tablets. These are the uncreated Quran. So it makes that claim itself. In chapter 10, verse 15 of the Quran, and in chapter 15, verse 9 of the Quran, and in chapter 18, verse 27 of the Quran, it says that Allah preserves the Quran and guards it from corruption. So if the Quran makes this claim that it's guarded by Allah himself, then there can be no human interference, there can be no human interaction. This cannot have any human intervention at all. If that is the case, it destroys not only God's work, but it destroys this inimitability. And they have to claim this inimitability. So they're w between a rock and a hard place. Even Yasser Qadi is between a rock and a hard place. Mm -hmm. And you're going to see that later on in the clip. You're going to see how he then comes and solves this problem. Because good old Hijab wants him to solve this problem. Watch and see. It's not going to come up yet. It'll come up later on. Look and see how Yasser Qadi solved this problem 25 years ago at Yale University. He has to preserve the text because God preserves the text. Mm -hmm. And this is the eternal text. We don't make these claims about our Bible. Thank God we don't make our claims that our, our Bible is eternal. Thank God we know that it was written by man. We don't make the claims that it is eternal. We don't make the claims that it was sent down, inspired by God, but not eternally and, and sent down like it was to Muhammad over a 22-year period between 610 and 632. We would say that it was complete when it was formed, and, uh, like the Muslims, but as far as unchanged, that's the other thing they have to preserve, the idea that it never changes. Because if it is changed, that's human intervention. Once you admit any human intervention with even one word, with one letter, even some Muslims say even with one dot, once you do that, you're then saying that man has now interceded for God. Man has now changed God's holy word, and that cannot at all ever be uh, admitted to. So you can see the dilemma, on not only for the Yasser Qadis over here, but also the Muhammad Hijab. They have to hold up, they have to hold up this inimitability. They have mm -hmm. to hold up this preservation. They dare not acquiesce, whether they are from the academic world or whether they are from the traditional world. They cannot acquiesce on this one point. On that, they are both agreed. So how are they going to come to this conclusion? Let's see what Yasser Qadi mm -hmm. says. And, uh, and, and by the way, you, you mentioned the, the position that Yasser Qadi is now in. Uh, when he came out and, and admitted all this stuff that we're, uh, we're, we're going to be watching here, when he came out and admitted this stuff, um, Muslims obviously went into a rage that he was hurting their faith and so on. Uh, but, you know, people like me, I was looking at it going, wow, I, I, I have a lot of respect for this guy for admitting all of these things right now, even though there's going to be a backlash. I have respect for him for his willingness to face the backlash that's going to come to him. I have to, I have to respect his courage and, and speaking truthfully. And then of course, as soon as the backlash, so, so at that point, at that point, he could have stood his ground afterwards. He could have stood his ground and said, look, I, I know I upset a lot of people. I know you're upset at me, but you know, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, I can't lie to you. I can't lie to you. There are some mm -hmm. issues here that, you, that if you've been told perfect preservation right down to the letter, it is not true. It's not true. What do you want me to do? Do you want me to lie to you? I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it, and if, if if everyone uses this against me, then so be it. I'm not I'm not gonna I'm not gonna I'm not gonna lie. I'm I'm not gonna uh, diverge from the truth. He could have did that, and he would have had he would have had a my perpetual respect for that. <laughs> Instead, as soon as the backlash came, he immediately backed down. He blamed Islamophobes. He said, "This is all Islamophobes. They're all doing this, and 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 they're they're taking things out of context, and so on." And then it's now I need to now I need to get rid of the comment section, start filing false uh, false copyright yeah. claims, and so now it's now whereas before it would have been Muslims upset at him, and other people actually respecting him and taking him more seriously. Yeah. Now yeah. instead of that, it's Muslims are still angry at him, and I view him as a coward now. I view him as a total deceptive coward. Right? If you're filing a false copyright complaint to cover up information because your 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 feelings are hurt by the backlash, now I regard you as a lying coward. So now he now he's in trouble with with everyone, and we'll see why. All right, here we go. Well, let me, let me oh, get ahead. to the clip. Let me mm -hmm. Just say one more thing. In, at Speaker's Corner, one of the things we were always told is that you don't want to get a very tall ladder because the higher the ladder you stand on, the further you're going to fall. I get it. And I think this is the problem right now with the Quran. When you have these verses, like chapter 10, verse 15, chapter 15, verse 9, and chapter 18, verse 27, the Quran itself has put it up on such a high pedestal, it's put it up on such a high level, that it is easy for now to, to destroy that. And that's why I feel sorry for Muslims. I feel sorry for the Yasser Qadis. I feel sorry for the Muhammad Jobs. They are in a dilemma here, because they've got to... They've got to argue preservation. They dare not leave that, that one text, because if there's any notion that there is any 
human intervention. It destroys the Quran. If it destroys the Quran, it destroys everything they believe. This is at the foundation of everything they believe. Remember, everything that Muslims go to is one book modeled by one man. The Book and the Man. You've heard me do this many times, David. Book and the, the, the Man. Book and the Man. You've got to go to that book. You've got to go to that man. And what we're seeing here is the, the book starting to crack. We're seeing the edifice, the, the bottom rungs starting to fail. And that's why what you saw there not a week and a half ago was not just the two worlds colliding. It was also the two worlds realizing we don't know how to defend this. We still don't know how to defend this. That was 25 years ago he had that crisis. Let's go and see how he does it. Let's see what he says. Here we go. Back to Sheikh Yasser Qadi and Muhammad Hijab was in relation to this question of the relationship between Ahraf and the Qiraat, basically. No, 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 the crisis I had wasn't that. The crisis I had was, well, yeah, I mean, that, that, that was what generated. But what was the crisis? The crisis was very simple. Traditional understandings of Ahraf and Qiraat cannot answer some of these pressing questions that are now being poked by our uh, people outside of, by our academics, not our, by their academics outside of the faith tradition. You see, in a Muslim environment, there's always some respect that we have for the Quran. We should. In a Muslim environment, we'll press a little bit and then we'll say, okay, khalas, sami'na wa ata'na. And that's great, alhamdulillah. When you go to academia, they don't have that red line. And they're going to just, you know, the, 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 the famous story of the emperor with no clothes. They're going to just point out, no, that doesn't make any sense. Well, that's not true. And this and that. And they'll bring issues, which I'm not going to mention explicitly, that you know are true because they're in your own books. They're not inventing anything new. They'll bring you riwayat and they'll bring you athar and then you add to that very well-known issues of, I don't even want to be explicit. And then you bring on top of that makhtutat and then and then. And it's very clear to you and to every single very advanced student and specialist that the standard narrative has holes in it. That's what I'm going to say. The standard narrative does not answer some very pressing questions. These are now well-known within the Western uh, Academy. Uh, that they're bringing forth issues. Their level of now knowledge is leaps and bounds above what it used to be, you know, hundred years ago. What is happening in the last few years is not me anymore. It's the Western academics. These, these problems are now becoming mainstream. And by and large, our ulama in the Eastern world are not aware, by and large, of what's going on in the Western side of things. And they're not answering those questions in a manner that it needs to be answered. Well, those are the uh, those are the Yasser Qadi clips we had pulled up. But uh, guys, if you take nothing else away from what Sheikh Yasser Qadi said, just remember that there are holes in the narrative, ladies and gentlemen. There are holes in the narrative. What's the What's the narrative? Well, it's that uh, Muslim scholars have all of this stuff figured out, and all you know. Uh, for, for, the narr for the narrative at the popular level, it's perfect preservation right down to the letter. And if you do a little research and you start coming across all these uh, differences in different versions of the Quran, like if you actually uh, look at the different Qurans that uh, Hatun Taj puts out and so on, if you, if you look at those differences and you start wondering, well, don't worry, scholars have all of this figured out. They understand, you know, we've got the, the, the Ahruf and we've got the Kirat and we understand the, 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 the relationship between the Ahruf and we and that in the, in the Karat and how that all relates to uh, the Uthmanic recension. We understand how all of this works together. And that's what you'll hear at the popular level. If you start digging into this, you'll, you'll start to hear, oh, we've got all this figured out. And Yasser Qadi lets the cat out of the bag and says, there are holes in the narrative. There are problems with, there are problems with this story. Uh, Jay, uh, did you want to comment on some, some holes in the narrative? <laughs> <laughs> My goodness, I was I was just writing this. I wrote these these to these notes down as he was going through. The traditional understanding of Ahruf and Kirat cannot answer pressing questions by Western academics. See, we're the problem. Mm -hmm. It's the Western academics that are the problem. Now he's blaming us for even asking these questions. But I love it when he talked about that red line. And he put his hand up there and he says, There's a red line beyond which we don't go. See, we have a respect for the Quran. We have a respect. We won't go beyond that. We just accept that there are different traditions. We just accept that there are different get off and different ahrus. We don't ever ask this. But see, I live in the West. I live in America. And here, the West, they go beyond that red line. There's the problem. And you Easterners, those of you in the East, those of you in the traditional crowd, you don't have to live in the world that I'm living in, is what he's saying. I have to live in this world. I, ha I got my credit credibility. I've got my reputation to worry about. And I have to straddle both worlds. 
Can you see? He did not want to answer this question because he still has that reputation from Yale University and not from all the different TV shows he's been. He's been all over the TV here in the United States. He is the moderate face of Islam that everybody loves. And he's got to still live in that world. And he's still got to be able to communicate that world. And he still has to maintain some type, some type of balance. But over here in the traditional world on this side, you've got a whole different category of people that want him to come hand down and just say, this is not a problem. This is mm -hmm. not a problem. And he says, listen, that's where you are. You don't go, you don't want, you know it's not a problem because you don't go past that red line. I don't go past that red line. I cannot go past that red line, except 25 years ago. And remember, he said, I had a crisis and this got out of the bag now. He didn't want it to get out of the bag. If you look at the first hour and 20 minutes, you can see that they brought this up. And that's why it's fascinating that he's blaming even his the converts coming up in Muhammad Hijab's uh, 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 from his material uh, his converts there in London who are causing this problem. He didn't want people to know about this crisis. Mm -hmm. And what did he say? It's fascinating. This crisis when Muhammad Hijab said, "Well, is this the crisis? Is this?" The no, no, no. That's not the crisis. He said, "No, that's not the crisis. <laughs> the crisis was of understanding and knowledge." What understanding? What knowledge? Well, really, it's this. But he didn't want to talk. He didn't want to say that this was the crisis. But this is exactly the crisis. It's obvious that this is the crisis. And that's why he doesn't want to talk about it. He doesn't want to do it in a 20-minute soundbite. And he said that. Mm -hmm. This is not for you. to. This must be done behind closed doors. And then we're going to get, we're going to get the, the damage stuff coming up. But it's mm -hmm. fascinating that he's talking about this emperor... No, with the emperor with, with the, uh, no clothes on. Yeah. Remember he brought that up? Yeah. And then he quickly shut up. He didn't want to go through with that because he realized he is the emperor with no clothes. Yeah. Actually, he is the one that's that's actually that the emperor. He is the one that's naked. Or, or really, and really, he, really, all of all of Islam and its presentation of the history of the Quran, right? Like they're walking around like we've got this awesome explanation here. We've got this perfect book, and <laughs> according. Why did he bring that into the conversation? Yeah, I know. According to Does according, he not know the rest of the story. Yeah, Does according he not know to the little girl that actually says, "Well, he has no clothes on." Yeah, guys, do do, do you understand the story? This is Yasser Khadi brings it up, right? He he says he brings it up. Yeah, he, he says we. The top way. When he realizes, oh, oh, I'm the one that th I'm the emperor. Yeah, and, that's and the, the says, Western the, the Western academics are the kids who say, "Look, you're naked. What's wrong with you, you idiots? You're naked, right?" And so he you does. Know, so he immediately he immediately so, shut that one down. <laughs> he shut it down. He didn't want to go any further. He realized I can't say anymore. The camera's on me. Yeah. I better not say anymore. I'm going to be seen naked. But then he goes on and then he talks about. He says, you know. The academics, they don't have this and these issues, which we have. And I say, yes, that's absolutely true. Yes, Akadi, you live in America. We are Judeo-Christian in society here. We ask everything. You look at this whole idea of criticism, this whole idea that has to do with redacted criticism. We're talking about source criticism. We're talking about literary criticism. Where do you think those were invented? They were invented on this book. All those criticisms, the whole historical critique was all created on the Bible. As Christians, we've always opened our Bibles up to criticism. Who do you think Wellhausen is? He was a Christian. What do you think the Tübingen School was doing in the 1800s in Germany? They were doing the, the whole documentary hypothesis. It all came about the Bible. The Bible has always been put up to criticism. The Bible, we've always allowed it to be criticized. Our Lord Jesus Christ, he himself put himself up to criticism. He wouldn't let anybody defend him. Even the one time that Peter took out that sword to defend him in the Garden of Gethsemane, what did Jesus do? He turned towards Peter and says, put away your sword. I don't need that kind of defense. I don't need the sword to defend me. He who lives by the sword dies by the sword. That's in Matthew chapter 26. Uh, and you can see this kind of criticism is something that Christianity has dealt with for 2,000 years. And that's why when you come to a Judeo-Christian environment like we have here in the West, our schools are based on that kind of critical thought. Our whole Bible is the one that created that critical thought. You would not have historical criticism or redacted criticism or source criticism, any of these criticisms, without the Bible. And that's where our good friend Yasser Qadi has had to do his schooling. And here he was at Yale University 25 years ago, and he started hearing these claims and these criticisms of something as simple as Gira. That is not very damaging. That is not very difficult. He's going to find out there's much more difficult things way beyond the Gira that we're going to introduce tonight mm -hmm. uh, that uh, Dan Brubaker is introducing. Mm -hmm. Once he gets to that, one, when, let's see what crisis of faith he's going to have then. But remember, we don't go beyond that, he says. We have a respect for the Quran, and I think there is the problem right there. It's that respect that we're saying, hold on a minute, that respect makes you naked. 
You're mm. the emperor with no clothes because you've got to ask these questions of your Quran. When you make claims that there was one complete Quran that was put together, and I don't want to jump the gun right now. I want to wait to that because we need to wait till we, until we get to that part later on in this talk. But I think this is meaning that he is finally saying that it's very clear that the standard narrative, that's the standard narrative, that's the traditional narrative, that's what you guys have in the East, that's what you have been working with for over a thousand years now. Remember, this Kirat is over a thousand years old. The Kirats were all created in the 8th and ninth century. Where now in the 21st century. It's the standard narrative has holes and cannot answer some of the very pressing questions. Westerners' level of knowledge is leaps and bounds above what it used to be. We can no longer sit there and, and, and even answer them. And that's why it's fascinating how where he's going to finally go to get his answer. This is not hidden news. He was saying, listen, are you listening to me? This is not hidden anymore. By and large, you Eastern West uh, Ulema scholars, you uh, Muhammad Hijab, and remember, Muhammad Hijab is not a scholar. I don't know of any degree that Muhammad Hijab has done. This guy is not a scholar. Yes, sir, Qadi is. But he's talking about the ulema in the East. These people in Medina, in Mecca, these people in Al-Azhar University, there in Cairo. These are the ones he's talking about. By and large, you scholars are not aware of what's going on here in the West. What I have to deal with. I'm in a different world. I have to deal with this. You don't have to deal with this. Therefore, this is the most difficult problem for me. Amazing. Mm -hmm. And I, I agree with you, David. I thought, gosh, this guy is actually honest. Mm -hmm. This guy is actually saying, can you hear what I'm saying, Muhammad Job? Please don't ask me this question. This is not something I want to get into because I've had to deal with this for 25 years. Now, I was hoping that he would have an answer after 25 years. And so was Muhammad hoping that he would have an answer after 25 years. Mm -hmm. Let's go and see what Muhammad does next. Because what Muhammad does next is absolutely <laughs> revealing. Because you can see he is pleading with uh, Yasser Qadi to come up with an answer. And let's see what he does. Let's oh, play the next clip. Actually, I don't have that clip pulled up. Um, okay, well, let me just tell you what happens next. Are you talking about with the, if you had a blank Musaf? Yeah. He puts out his hand. Yeah. He says, here is a, he doesn't do it once. He does it four times in that clip. I countered it this afternoon. I wanted to see, make sure that I, I find out. Four times he asked Yasser Qadi, what about the, that, that, if I give you a blank sheet right now, what are you going to write on it? What are you going to write on it? Is this going to be Hafs? Is this going to be Warsh? Is this going to be Kunbul? Is this going to be Nafi? Is this going to be Al Duri? Which one are you going to write? Which not, one of these is the not, one that goes it's all not, the way? It's not an easy answer. That's exactly what Yasser Qadi says, right? So notice. It uh, should be yes or no. That's exactly what he says. He goes. I feel like, notice he says, he says, I feel like, he goes, I feel like it should be an easy, it, an easy answer, right? Because guys, do you, do you understand what he's saying? After all of the stuff and Sheikh Yasser Qadi saying, okay, well, look, man, uh, we, we got some problems here and uh, Muslims think we can deal with it and we can't. And we got some huge issues here. Muhammad Hijab throws what he thinks is this softball that's going to, you know, that's going to undo all of the damage that just happened all of the damage that was just done because this is jay this is what i always hear from muslims i always hear well you know even even if you just wiped all qurans out we have so many quran so many people have memorized the quran we could just take a blank paper and we could just write it all out and we'd have the perfect perfect reflection of what what goes back to muhammad so hijab rolls with that theory hey if i gave you a a blank book right now could you write out the quran that goes right back to muhammad um, and, and, and Yasser Qadi, not an easy answer. Good job. Well, it should be an easy answer. It's not an easy answer. You're pushing me. Don't push me on this one. And it's just, it's... Uh... And he says something that's very revealing. And I, I, I see you don't have the clip, so let me just go ahead. I wrote it down. He says, this issue of Qira'at has troubled Muslim scholars from the very beginning. And he says, we are a group of 15. There are 15 of us that are now discussing this. So this is 25 years later. He had this crisis there in Yale. And now 25 years later, he is now getting 50 scholars, 15, one five, to go and try to come up with some type of answer. And he says, we of us, there are 15 opinions about this, but none of us have an answer fully the question that are raised. We can't even answer it yet. And he says, he goes on and says later on that he has been spending the last 25 years, especially the last 10 years, the last 10 years, he has been going deep. He talks about that going deep into it. And then when, uh, when uh, uh, Muhammad Hijab says, okay, well, what about that blank piece of paper? What are you going to put on it? He says, don't talk about it now. After this, after this recording, we can talk about it. And why don't you take my class? Because if you can take my class, there you can find the answer. 
It's fascinating. It can, uh, you, we cannot answer this question in a 20-minute interview. Thus, I have never brought this topic up myself, he says. Well, isn't that interesting? Um, uh, do you have any more clips, or can I just go and continue on what, what he did say next? Yeah, you continue on. I'm going to see if I can actually get the clip so we can actually watch it so that everyone knows that we haven't uh, we haven't misrepresented them. So I think I can actually pull the – I think I can – I don't have the clip pulled up here. I basically have to get it on uh, on this because this is where I, I have a program for downloading clips and uh, can shift it over there. But probably take me three, four minutes and something like that, and I can have the clip pulled up. Okay, let me just keep talking while you're doing that, David. I'll uh, give you so we can uh, continue. So what's fascinating to me, he then goes on and he says, it should never be brought up in public. He said, now, this is the second time he's brought this up. It should be never be brought up in public. Those who brought it up are idiots. Those of you who brought it up, and he's talking about those, I'm assuming he's talking about Muhammad Hijab's converts there in England who brought it up and brought it into the public. They are idiots. This should never be discussed amongst the masses. Now, I don't recall anything in Christianity where we can't discuss amongst the masses. Can you, David? I don't recall anything. Is there any subject that we say should not be brought up? Is there any subject that we say must be kept behind closed doors? Is there any subject that we say, no, don't talk about this amongst the, uh, certainly even amongst the new converts? Everything is open fair game. And that's why whenever I did my studies, it was because I went to seminary and actually heard these kind of discussions, heard these kind of arguments. Now, is that going on right now, what I'm hearing in the background? Okay, they can't hear, so I can keep talking. I'm hearing two things coming from my earphones and what is going on publicly. So, fascinating to me, we were told absolutely to ask any question we wanted to, to talk about any part of Scripture we wanted to, and our professors were there to then defend it. But certainly, this is not something we do behind closed door. But evidently now, we're getting a whole different paradigm here. We're getting a whole different paradigm of what is done in the madrasas, what is done in, in Islamic universities. They have certain questions you are not permitted to ask. They have a red line. That red line you don't go beyond. Why? Because out of respect. Remember what David said earlier. You not only respect your, your, uh, you, not the, your teachers, you don't want to respect those who have gray hair like me. I wish that was happening today here in the West. But you respect also these questions. You respect the Quran. That is not what's ha that is not what we saw happening uh, a week ago there on May 9th, May 8th. Because there here you have Muhammad Hijab who wanted an answer at this time. So then he puts his hand out a second time. And he says, what is it you're going to put here? What are you going to write? And then he says... He said, listen, I've never, I've never ever, this is uh, Yasef Khadr, I have never talked about this in public. You won't see any video of this in public with me. He says, because I don't want to say something that will embarrass the Quran. So let me be the problem. I want me to be the problem. I don't want ever to, the Quran to be the problem. Let me be the fall guy. Let me say I don't know what I'm talking about. Let me say that there is, I cannot come up with an answer. I would rather be, be the one that gets the embarrassment. I would rather me be thrown under the bus, but not the Quran. We must not let the Quran be put under the bus. Why? Because Allah preserves his Quran. Allah preserves his word. Chapter 10, verse 15. Chapter 15, verse 9. Chapter 18, verse 27. He had no other recourse but to go back to the Quran, to go back to this preservation, to go back to this mantra. And then finally, it comes up. He says that all the Kirat in the Quran, he finally says, when Muhammad Hijabs gets exasperated, puts out his hand one more time, he says, what is going to be there? And then finally he says, all the Qirat are the Quran. To understand this, take my class. Because it takes background and information. And that was fascinating is what he did next. He went into a, what I call a mantra. I don't know if you mean what I mean by that. And he went into this narrative that he had memorized. And he just started looking at the camera. And he says, the Quran is the uncreated speech of Allah. The Quran is preserved. The Quran is known. The Quran is mutawatir. Uh, mutawatir means the successive, successive isnad. All the kira'at are the Quran. All the kira'at are the Quran. Are you getting that? That means all of these 93,000 differences that Hatun's team has now found in these 37 different Qurans that she now possesses there in London. Just looking at 23 of them, they've already found 93,000 differences. So all these 93,000 differences are the Quran. All are authentic. Leave it at that, Muhammad. Beyond this requires background information. 
take my class. It is enough to know that the Quran is the speech of Allah. It is protective. It is protective. What is he referring to? There is chapter 10, verse 15. There is chapter 15, verse 9. There is chapter 18, verse 27. He is actually, he's just come back onto this narrative that he has been taught since he's a little child. This is the narrative that all Muslims are taught. And they're taught never to question this. You do not question the preservation. You do not go beyond that red line. You give respect to that book. Why? Because the Quran demands it. So therefore, rather than even answer this question, don't even answer the question, just go into this little mantra, this little mantra that's memorized, that they all have memorized. And we saw that vividly there in this interview. Go ahead, David. I'll put it back to you. Um, let's see. I believe I, believe I have uh, found the clip, created the clip, and shared the clip over here. And uh, wow, so so this will this uh, the clip I wanted to pull up because it's so huge because it's it's sort of at the end of all of Yasser Qadi's admissions and acknowledgments and just the em embarrassing dumpster fire of, of of an interview for Islam. How bad this was! At the end of it all, uh, Hijab tries to tries to bring it around to tries to bring things into his safe space, right? I at least know, I at least know that, you you know, you could just, you know, rewrite the Quran and write exactly what goes back to Muhammad. So let's go ahead and, and watch a little of this clip. And I have a, I have a longer clip. I'll probably play, you know, 45 seconds of it or so. And then we'll, we'll, we'll pause uh, just for review here. Cause this is, this is really, really important, especially, you know, after all the discussion that, that preceded it. Let's see what uh, Hijab says here. So I think if I were to give you a blank mushaf, yeah, and uh, and tell you to write what is munazzal verbatim from Allah into that mushaf with no human interference. Would you write something which corresponds? It's with not an easy answer. It's not an easy yes or no. It is enough for the Muslim to believe that the I Quran think this should be an easy yes or no, though. Yes, al Khadi. I, I have to. Okay, very, very well. So, yeah, Muhammad, after we get off this phone call, I just wanted to pause it there because, man, I could. We could watch that like 20 times. Uh, notice notice the, the flow of the discussion here. Uh, I'm going to throw you a softball here. Obviously, obviously, you being a great scholar, you could put together, even if you're acknowledging there are all these problems and all these questions we might not be able to answer, at the very least, at the very <laughs> least, if I gave you a you know uh, some blank paper, you could, you could write the Quran, the Quran that goes back to the time of Muhammad. It's not an easy answer. And Hijab replies, I think it should be an easy answer. And and <laughs> Yasser Qadi's response is, oh, well, oh, okay. <laughs> okay, if you if you want to believe that. But guys, if, if you think about the position that Hijab was putting Yasser Qadi in, right? Yasser Qadi has to live a double life. He has to live a double life. He goes amongst Western scholars in order to... to in order to get along and be respected amongst Western scholars, he can't be spouting complete idiotic nonsense like one Quran perfectly preserved right down to the letter from the time of Muhammad. He would be laughed out of Yale for saying something that ridiculous, right? But on the other hand, he can't be saying the stuff that he would admit at Yale in a scholarly environment. He can't say that amongst your, your regular Muslims because it will completely destroy their faith in one Quran yeah. perfectly preserved right down to the letter. So he can't, he can't say certain things the, he, he can't say the things that someone might want to say amongst the popular level Muslims. He can't say those things among scholars. And he can't say the things he would say among scholars. He can't say those among uh, popular level Muslims. Yeah. So this yeah. is what Jay is talking about with this worlds colliding. They are colliding in this person of Yasser Qadi. <laughs> Hijab forces him into it. Hijab says, all right, here you are. Oh, worlds are colliding right now. Now you tell us something. You tell us something that all the scholars are going to agree with and Muslims can agree with. And, and Yasser Khan, nope, can't do it because these worlds, these worlds have to be separated. And that's why he keeps saying you can't have this discussion in public. You can't talk about this. You, you yeah. can't. You cannot. Muslims are not ready for, for the truth here. And so it's just amazing. Yasser Khan, I mean, Yasser Khan, what he's saying is these worlds cannot be brought together. They have to be separated because one yeah. would destroy the other. 
and you, you, you popular level Muslims, you're not going to you're not going to destroy the beliefs of the scholars. You don't you, you, you would need evidence to do that. And so what would happen if you brought these worlds together was these scholars would completely destroy your faith in Islam. I can't allow that to happen. So Muhammad Hijab, if you want to ask me a question afterward, please do so. But we cannot we cannot go on with this. Amazing, amazing stuff. By the way, I have I have much more of that clip if you wanted to uh, if you wanted to to continue it at, at any time. Right. So then, are we going to show any more clips of that? That we're going to stop. We can. We can continue with that clip. I paused it right there because that 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 first like forty seconds was so beautiful. Go on with the clip because this this is where it all comes out. This is where it really comes to a a, a crescendo and then finally comes to doing denouement. So go ahead, show the rest of it and let's unpack that. All right. Here we go. You let's have a number of discussions. No problem. I'm very yeah. open with advanced students, but these issues should not look. It is kalamullah. What is going to be written? It is kalamullah. What, 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 what would you write? Uh, 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 let's you not. Write? Let, let's. You, you're pushing me, and I'm saying it's not hikmah to listen. I have a condition. Like I said, everything I say is going to be factual. If I wanted to do okay. tawdi and whatnot, I would do it right now in front of you. There is no need for tawdiya. The Quran is the uncreated speech of Allah. The Quran is preserved. The Quran is known. The Quran is mutawatir. And alhamdulillah, all of the qiraat are the Quran. All of the qiraat are authentic. Alhamdulillah. Leave it at that, ya Beyond this, honestly, I have no problem. We'll have a discussion or take my class. But beyond this requires... Uh, so yeah, I, I have I have more if you want to continue on by that. But uh, he kind of uh, he, he kind of made his point. You know, leave it at that. Leave it at that. If you want any more than that, you have to you have to take my class. Uh, can't discuss this in public. Can't have this discussion. Muslims are not ready for this information, so we have to hide it from them. If they start realizing there is a, there is a problem, we have to go into panic mode, start closing stuff down, filing false copyright claim, taking down the comments section. This is Islam, ladies and gentlemen. You, you guys have nothing to no one to blame except your leaders for lying to you like this and mm -hmm. yourselves for letting them get get away with it. Right, you, you're you're the ones who let you're the ones who who let them get away with it. All right, what are your thoughts, Jay? David, I mean, this is, we could go on. I don't think we need to do any more. I think we've done the damage as far as looking and just unpacking what he said so far. The damage has already been done by Yasser Qadi. He has he is uh, he is he is caught between a rock and a hard place, and I feel sorry for him. Me too. I, I absolutely do feel sorry for him, and I have the same sentiments you had from the very beginning. He, I, I don't know how what I would do in that position. We don't have that problem in Christianity. We don't have that problem with our scriptures, because we don't have those kind of claims to defend to begin with. But more than more than that, we would never suggest in, in front of a camera that don't tell me, ask me this question, wait till I, wait till after the camera's down, I'll talk to you one to one, or take my class. Keep on taking, why would you want to take his class if he can't even answer the question in five minutes? In front of a camera what is he going to tell you in his class that he hasn't told you already and if you cannot say this in public then what's the purpose of spending years 25 years he says he's going to say that later on and that the last 10 years he's gone deep into this to try to find out he has 15 others that are working with him to try to come up with a solution on this and yet after 25 years they still don't have a solution that they can communicate it to the camera that they can communicate to me that they can communicate to Mohammed hijab and if they can't communicate it to the camera or cannot communicate it to me and and cannot communicate to Muhammad Hijab, then where in the world and what is left for Islam? Because what they're basically saying is there is no answer. This is too much cognitive dissonance. We don't know what to do with this. Mm -hmm. Rather, just don't ask me this anymore. But he does give an answer. At the very end, he does give an answer. In fact, he already intimated in that last bit that you were just going through. He says all of the kirat of the Quran, all of the kirat are authentic. Every one of them. That means all of these, here they are. These are the 30 kiraat. Here are the 10, and here are the 20 on this side. These are the first seven right here. These are the first seven that were then canonized by uh, uh, Mujahid. Mujahid in, and look at his dates, 936. And these are the ones that are supposedly from the time of Muhammad, right? Take a look at their dates. Do you want me to read their dates to you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look at the dates they died. So Nafi died in 785. He was born in 689. Was he living at the time of Muhammad? Mm -mm. Muhammad died in 632. That's 50 years later. Ibn Kathir died in 738. He was born in 666. So he was nowhere around. That's 30 years after Muhammad died. He was even born. Abu Amr al ibn al Allah was born, died in 770. Ibn Amir al Dimash died in 736. Asim ibn Abi al Najud died in 745. Hamza al Zalyat died in 772. Al Kisa'i died in 805. 
None of these guys were living when Muhammad was living. None of them were there. So how could these be the seven readers that Muhammad's still referring to? How could these be the seven kiraat that Muhammad's referring to, the seven recitation? They were not even from the same century Muhammad lived. Have Muslims looked at this? Are you looking at the dates? But hold on a minute. Another three were added. These three down here. And these were added by Al-Jazadi in 1429. That's the 15th century. Look at their dates. 748, 821, 844. That's the 9th century. That's 200 years later. Hold on a minute. These 10, are these 10, this book right here? Where did this book come from? Where did this Quran come from? Do you know, David? What's uh, the name of this book? Uh, Who the, is the one that this is taken from? Are, are you talking about the, the, the Hafs? Hafs? Yeah. Who is Hafs? Have I said his name so far? Dep dep nope, depends on who you ask, though. Because <laughs> some, would, well, some would say he's a deceiver. If it could. Okay, but more than that, remember at the very beginning, we, w we went and we looked at these two, uh, these two, uh, these two, what we called Al-Buhari, volume 6, Hadith number 509 and 510. And 510, we went through this purposely. I wanted you to go through this purposely because at the time of Uthman, so we're talking about 652, Uthman turns to Zaid ibn Tabid, who he is now called to rewrite the Quran a second time, and he says to him, write it in the Qureshi dialect. That means you have to write it in the dialect of the Hijaz. The Quraysh is where Muhammad lived, supposedly, and he lived in the Hijaz, which is in the central part of Arabia. This is not up in Syria. This is not way over in Iraq. This is in Arabia, and that's the Quraysh dialect that they spoke in that place. So they're supposed to write it in that Quraysh dialect, right? Mm -hmm. Well, let's go back to this list again. I wish I'd given this to you. I should have sent this to you so you could put it up on your screen so everybody could look at it. But notice these are the two lists of transmitters that each one each one of these readers has two transmitters that transmitted their own text and they do not agree with theirs so you have every two disagrees with the with the reader and these are Kalun, look at the dates, 835, 864, 869. These are all 9th century. These are some 9th century, some are 10th century, 10, 904. But one of them is the one that I circled in black. The one I circled in black is the one that was finally chosen in Cairo in 1924. In Cairo in 1924, they had a problem with the educational authority because all the high school students there in Cairo were asked, answering different uh, on standardized tests, they were giving different answers. And the reason they were giving different answers is because the Qurans they were using were all different. They had 30 different Qurans that they were using, 30 different answers. There's no way you could you could have standardized tests. So they went to Al-Azhar University. They went to a man named Muhammad Abi, uh, Ibn or Ali Ibn uh, Al-Husayni Al-Haddad. That's his name. Muhammad, have you heard this name before? Ibn Al-Husayni Al-Haddad. Remember that name. Because he is the one that chose Huffs. He is the one that chose Huffs, but he doesn't give a reasoning. Now, if he was going to choose any of these 30, why didn't he go back to the first two? Why didn't he go back to the first seven? Why didn't he go back to the first 10? And why didn't he go back to Mecca and Medina? To the Qureshi dialect. Remember, that's what, that's what Uthman said at the very beginning. It must be in the Qureshi dialect. These, that would therefore refer to either Nafi al Madina or Ibn Kathir al Makkah. Those are two of the readers that come from the Hijaz, from the very area that Uthman is saying you must have this dialect. So, why didn't Muhammad ibn al Husayni al Haddad choose those two? He didn't. Who did he choose? This guy, way over here. Where is he from? He is from Kufa. Where is Kufa? Kufa is in Iraq. This is the Shams, remember? Right there in what we talked about at the very beginning of the hour. They said that the Hudayfa comes to Uthman and he says, we've got a problem because these people in Shams, they have a completely different recitation. This is the recitation that does not agree with our recitation. Make sure that they don't have different Qurans like the Christians and the Jews. So Uthman says to Zaid ibn Tabit, come here and rewrite the, the book, rewrite the Quran in the Qureshi dialect so that the, well, those in Shams do not have a different recitation so we have the correct recitation. So what does Muhammad al-Husayni al-Haddad do? He doesn't go back to the Qureshi, he goes to Shams, he goes to the very thing they're not supposed to do, and he chooses a guy named Hafs, who was, bar who was died in 796. Muhammad died in 632. This is 244 years later, this is hundreds of miles away, and hundreds of years later. What an idiot! Mm -hmm. And why has no one brought this up before? But hold on a minute, hold on a minute, hold on a minute. 
Hafs was chosen in 1924 for Cairo, right? What happened when he chose that der derivation for the city of Cairo there in Egypt in 1924? Do you know what happened next? What did they do with all the other 29 that disagreed with Hafs? Didn't they have to drown them or something? They took them out to a boat and threw them into the River Nile. And didn't you just get done saying a little while ago that when Muslims don't like something, they either burn it or they censor it or they stop comments on it or they drown it. Anytime they don't like something, they try to get rid of that which disagrees. So the other 29, they took out into a boat and they threw them into the Nile thinking that would get rid of them without realizing you can't get rid of them because our good old friend Hatun Tash was able to get all of them again just in 2015 and 2016. Almost 100 years later, they're still existing. You can go to marketplaces all over the Arab world and you can still get all 30 of them. She's found 37, so she's invented another seven that are not even on the official list. Well, listen, there are even more than 37. But can you see how hopeless this is? Can you then understand, put yourself in... Muhammad Hijab's place. He knows this. He's heard this. How are you going to deal with this? Put yourself in Yasser Qadi's place over here. He, there's nothing that I'm saying tonight that they all don't already know. The scholars know exactly what I'm saying. And when he went to Yale University 25 years ago and came across these other problems, these are just minor problems because that was only chosen in Cairo in 1924 for the city of Cairo. That was only chosen for the Department of Education in one city. It became so successful, however, if you get rid of all the other ones and just use one, you, that became so successful that in 1936, the Egyptian government made that Huff's text the official text for the whole country, all of Egypt. All of Egypt then went back to Huff's. This guy from Kufa, who died in 796, 244 years after Muhammad. This guy who is part of the Shams, the, the guy that they were all scared about way back in the time of Uthman, because that's the text you're not supposed to use. That is the, 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 that is the dialect you're not supposed to use. And yet that is the one that was chosen in Cairo. But because of the fact it makes it a lot more simple, and because of the fact it, certain, it then now says that we don't have to worry about the other 29, they chose that for all of Egypt. Now, who's doing the choosing? Man is doing the choosing. It's one man from one university in 1924 that made that choice. This is not God choosing it. This has nothing to do with Muhammad. This has nothing to do with Uthman. This has to do with one scholar in 1924 who made that choice. But it became so successful in Cairo, it became so successful in Egypt, that in 1985, King Fahd, King Fahd, who is the ruler of Egypt, I'm sorry, the ruler of Saudi Arabia at that time, King Fahd decided to make this Huff's text, this text that you see here, standard for the entire world. 1985. Now, David, I was alive in 1985. Were you? Yes, I was. Which means you and I are older than the canonical text. Boy, doesn't that make you feel old. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Anybody who was living in 1985, before 1985, there was no standard text. There were at least 30. We have now even got up to 37. Arabic Qurans, but now by 1985, this has become the standard text for the whole world. Because one man, again, remember, just this is one man who is now changing God's word, and he is the one that is now basically doing what God said he would not, God said would never happen, and that is, it is Allah who is supposed to guard his word. It is Allah who is going to protect the Quran. It is God who then said that this, this Quran has always existed. So what is the Quran that exists in heaven? What's on those preserved tablet. I would like to go to Allah and ask the same thing Muhammad Hijab asked, which is, if I give you a blank piece of paper, Allah, which is the one you're going to put in my hand? Mm -hmm. What do you think Allah is going to say? What do you think God, the Islamic God, is going to say? Well, first of all, you can't talk to him. He's totally distant. He never comes to earth anyways. But I would like to know what's going to happen when Muslims ask that question. What do you think they are going to say? What Quran are they going to talk about? And this is something that, uh, that Anand Rashid brought up <laughs> on Friday last week. I don't know if you heard what Adnan Rashid did. He did us a great favor. He said he decided to throw Yasser Qadi under the bus when he was asked this question. That's a shocker. That's a real shocker. This is what always happens when Muslims don't like each other. They just throw each other under the bus. And he said, well, I should have, if I had been asked that question, I would have gone back to the Birmingham folios. I would have gone back to those Tillo folios because that's the Quran he should have gone to. I would have gone back to the Husseini manuscript. That's the Quran he should have gone back to. Thank God for Adnan Rashid. Thank you, Adnan. You have just really brought it back to the 7th century. You see, this debate has always stuck over here in the 8th, 9th, and 10th century. The Kirat is a terrible dilemma for the Yasakadis and the Muhammad Hijabs. 
But that is not nearly the debate that I would like to talk about. The debate I want to talk about is what's happening in the 7th century. I would like to go back to the very beginning. I would like to go back to the time that Uthman lived. I would like to go back to the time of the prophet himself. I would like to go back to the century that supposedly this book was sent down to him over a 22-year period. I would like to go back to those first earliest copies, those first four copies that were made by Zaidi bin Thabit and sent to Basra, Baghdad, Damascus, and then one left in Medina, the Uba Ibn Qab's codex. I'd like to go to Ibn Masud's codex. I'd like to go to Ibn Musa's codex. I'd like to come to Zaid Ibn Thabit's codex. And I'd like to ask any Muslim who's watching me right now, where is there even one of those codices? One. I just want one. And, and That's exactly like this one right here. And, and 114 surahs, exactly like the razm. I'm not asking my kid out now. I'm not talking about vowelization. I'm not talking about the dots. I want the razm. I want the consonantal text. I want the skeletal text that's just like this book here. And and notice, uh, yeah, Yasser Qadi agrees with you, right? If, if you're saying you you would you would ask Allah, which one, which one? <laughs> Yasser Yasser Qadi acknowledged. I don't know. I, I don't know. But but you saw that little all of them. Yeah, that that you saw that problem that 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 he's stuck in, which is. Which which really shows you that that his his faith in this this wonderful book is is really at odds with the scholarship that he's being confronted with. Now, just to be clear, I, I haven't I haven't really studied uh, Kirat and and Ahruf way back way back when I was studying after Nabil had converted and so on. Uh, Nabil started studying the Kirat and Ahruf Ahruf, and he, he was telling me going, they can't figure out what this stuff means. They can't figure out what any of any of this stuff refers to. You go to you, he said he says you, you you can go to a book and get fifteen different interpretations of what these things even are. So I, I pretty much stayed uh, what I would call source based. Right? Look, if you tell me the Quran's been perfectly preserved, I will quote you a bunch of passages from your sources talking about missing chapters, uh, hundreds of verses coming up missing, um, verses being eaten by a sheep, uh, different you know phrases coming up missing. I'll talk to you. I'll, I'll just quote your sources to you and show you that the Quran has not been perfectly preserved. As for the the Ahruf and the Kirat, I'll wait until Muslims figure that stuff out and then they can tell me what all of this stuff means. Here we are, all these years later, and you, you know Shabir Ali's recent video that he, that he put out. You know, scholars don't don't know what the Ahruf refers to, and then you've got Yasser Qadi, and he's saying that every every student of knowledge knows the biggest problem is is the Ahruf and the Kirat and how they relate and what they do and how this relates to Uthman's version and so on. And the explanations we have just can't stand up to scrutiny. They can't stand up to scrutiny. So I'm thinking, what well, you guys cannot even come up with a with a coherent explanation. So uh, yeah, I, I don't know when I'm actually going to get around to studying anything beyond the basics. But Jay, j just just tell just tell me if this is sort of where things stand, right? Because David, we only have we only have 15 minutes now. Okay. In the last 15 minutes, we need to bring this to a conclusion. And I really want to get to the mother load. I really mm -hmm. want to get to the real damaging material. I really want to start introducing what Kadi has not yet looked at and what Shub and uh, the so Shub you want you want to you want to watch the uh, the clip from uh, from no. Brubaker? No, no, no. no. Oh, okay. let, 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 let me let's introduce that though. Yeah. But what I'd like to do is, I first I want to introduce his book. Mm -hmm. I want to introduce this book right here. Oh, Jay, because Jay, this... let, let me just ask that question. I wanted to because I wanted to make, I wanted to make, for a lot of people are confused. They're like because we're not explaining a lot about uh, a roof and things like that, and we're telling people we're not sure. But j just as far as where things stand, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. It's some it's something along these lines. You you've got Hatun. And she's got 37 different Qurans, not different translations, not just different, uh, not just different pronunciations. She's got different Qurans that have different Arabic text within them. And so the question would arise, why do you have these different texts and so on? And, and I would just say, well, because human beings are imperfect and they make mistakes along the way. And so you end up with differences, you know, especially, you know, especially going way back. But for someone like Yasser Qadi, who believes that, you know, Allah is somehow preserving things, He's got to explain these differences in terms of Ahruf and Kirat, but he can't say that these are based on later problems with Muslims not knowing where dots go or, you know, inserting the, the consonants and so on. He can't say that, you know, it's coming up later on. So he has to say somehow all of this goes back to the beginning and we just can't figure out how, and it's a one big massive mess. And that's why we can't discuss it in public. Is, is that basically the, the kind of no. takeaway story? No, no. And I think we need to be careful because Muslims are going to say that's all that we think. That's no, that's wrong. What we're saying, and this is much more. This no, is I, don't, I don't mean I don't mean what we're saying. I mean, 
Is that is that? That's not what Muslims are saying either. Okay, yeah, that's what, uh, that's, that's what I'm, that's trying, to the, I'm trying to get. I'm trying to get the relationship if here. Get, if you look at Shabir Ali's, and this is why Shabir, we have to be careful that we don't give them the wrong message. When when the Quran was written down, I don't know if you can see this, but when the Quran was written down, this is the, uh, the we have the Samarkand and the Sana. These are two of the earliest manuscripts right here. You notice there are no dots on them. Mm -hmm. You see that? This is known as Razm. Yep. Razm means the skeletal text. Mm -hmm. These are nothing more than consonantal text. There is about 15 letters, uh, roughly 15 letters that existed at the very beginning. Today, there are now 28 letters. How did it go from 15 to 28? Right? When I took Arabic, this is what was taught me. At the very beginning, there were only 15 letters. Well, in order to know what, because there's so many different ways of saying something, they had to put dots to make a distinction. Those dots were then added around the 8th century and the 9th century. They were canonized in the late 8th century. So by the early 9th century, when you have all these different kidot, you had then many different scholars and students who were putting their dots in many different areas, as I mm -hmm. said earlier, and that's where you get the kidot, the many no, the, different the, reading. Yeah, that, that's, that's what okay. I'm saying. Yeah, so uh, just because I... I, I I'm trying. I'm trying to get this straight for myself because I'm not completely clear on this. Because when I ask Muslims about it, they give all kinds of different explanations. What I'm saying is, when we have all these different modern uh, versions of the Quran, and what what I'm saying is, what would, would someone like Yasser Qadi explain that in terms of going back to issues of Kirat and uh, Ahruf and you you would say that Kirat comes along when when they're when they end up putting these these dots in different places and end up with different terms. But since Yasser Qadi has to believe that all of this goes back to Muhammad, he's stuck in a he's stuck okay. in a he's, he, he's got a problem. What goes back to Muhammad though? What goes back to Muhammad? Not the Kirat. Even though Ibn Mujahid said that there were seven readings, mm -hmm. there were really let's just, let's just throw that out the window. Muslims would actually be better by not saying that because you cannot get seven readings in a written text that early without the dots and the vowels. However, what you can do, and what they should be saying, and they are saying this, Shabir Ali it does say this, and Yasser Qadi, when, if he were, wherever it would communicate it better, does say this, and that is that the razm is the same. The razm is exactly the same. The skeletal text in the Hafs, in the Kulun, in the duty, all of these are exactly the same on all these manuscripts. So that's why that's right? that's why they're all the word of God and they all go back. That's right. Okay. So the Kirat, it really is nothing more than a set of disputes by different readers and different reciters in the 8th, 9th, and 10th century, late 8th, 9th, and 10th century. But the early 8th century and the 7th century is a completely different problem. And this is why I got so excited that Anand Rashid finally got us back to the real problem. And this is a much more damaging problem. Because the real problem is, what about these manuscripts? who don't have dots. This is the razm. And this is what they claim is has never, ever changed. This is the unpreserved Quran here. This is the Quran that has never changed. And it's the razm that you will see in every manuscript is exactly the same. Now, that's why Dr. Dan Brubaker, you know him, I know him, uh, he did his doctoral thesis. He had heard this since, well, we've, I've, been, I've heard this for 40 years, this idea that the razm is the same. The way that you dot it will change, and that's all we're talking about are the different dottings. But the razm never changes, and that's what God preserves, is the razm. And that's why Adnan Rashid said, if only Yasser Qadi had put out and showed him these two folios from the Birmingham manuscript, the manuscript, the Birmingham Quran, he called it. It's not a Quran. It's only two pages. It's only 33 verses. It's not even complete verses of chapter 18, 19, and 20. And it's all about things that have nothing to do with Islam. It's about the seven sleepers of Ephesus. It's from James the Lesser. It's the story of Moses. These have nothing to do with Islam. These are all pre-Islamic. These are from 145 AD, from 545 AD. These are all from before Muhammad. These are all before the Quran, and they're all before Islam. Now, if he said, if we'd only go back to those razm, if we'd only come back to these these original texts, we would find that there is no change. They are all exactly the same. Well, Dan was curious about this, and so he was decided for his doctorate. He was going to go back to those razm. He was going to go back to the original manuscript. He was going to go back to the Tokkapa, which is there in Istanbul. He was going to go back to the Samarkand, which is in Tashkent. He was going to go back to the Husseini, which is in Cairo, the one that Adnan Rashid wants us to go back to. He was going to go back to, to the Petropolitanus, which is in Paris, the Ma'il, which is there in the British Library, and also the Sana'a manuscript. Those are the six major manuscripts. I introduced these six major manuscripts to Shabir Ali in a debate we had in 2000. 2014, and Shabir Ali was not at all prepared to find out, to hear what we have found. Because see, two scholars, two Muslim scholars, between, between 2002 and 2007, in that five-year period, they went back to all those manuscripts, those six major manuscripts. 
and they went and they studied them for five years. By 2007, this is Dr. Tahir Atukulich and this is Ek, Dr. Ekmer Nisanadu. The two of them studied them for five years and they realized that what they had been claimed, every Muslim around the world believes that those six manuscripts go back to Uthman. They are called the Uthman Musaf. They're called the Musaf of Uthman. And these two Muslim scholars says not one of them is from the time of Uthman. Not one of them is from 652, mid 7th century. They're not even copies of the ones from Uthman. In fact, the dates they gave to them were from the 8th and 9th century. The earliest one, the earliest one is the Sana'a manuscript, which is discovered in 1975 by accident there in the Sana'a dome of the Sana'a mosque. When they were uh, uh, opened up a trap door, all these manuscripts fell to the ground. Amongst them were these uh, fragments of the, what they know as the Sana'a manuscript. When they looked at them, there were no dots on them. There were no diacritical marks. They couldn't read them, and that's why they had to bring the, the German scholars down in 1981 to look at them. Dr. Gerd Prynne, Dr. von Bothmer, Dr. Oleg, the three of them were flown down to look at them. They took pictures of them, and they realized that they were looking at the old this Quran existed. But the date that has been given to that Quran is 705. That's the earliest date, 705. So this is not the 6th century, I'm sorry, this is not the 7th century, this is the 8th century. But what was interesting, Dr. Dan Brubaker wanted to go back to these manuscripts, but he also wanted to go to four others. So he went to 10 manuscripts that are all from the 8th and 9th century, none of them from the 7th century. Not one of them is complete. And he found that not one of them agrees with each other. Now, this is what Dr. Atukulich and this is what Ekmenuddin Isanulu said. But what Dr. Dan Brubaker wanted to find out was what in the world uh, can we find when we look at the Akru? I'm sorry, excuse me, at the Razum, at the Razum, at the skeletal text. And he started finding these kind of things. I don't see if you can see it. Can you notice that there is a word there that's in a different color? Mm -hmm. Can you notice there's a word there, al Allah, which is out in the margin? It's not in the text. It should be right here. There's another word there where it should be replacing, but it's not been replaced. This is a human in, uh, intentional change. Are you getting that? Mm -hmm. This is not accidental. This is an intentional change. You can see it's a different im, it's a different nib, it's a different ink. It's done much later than when the original manuscript. Uh, he, there's one, two, three, four changes, intentional changes on just this one page. Now, what he noticed as he started looking at these, he started, he came up with 800 of these by the time he did his doctoral thesis, finished his doctoral thesis in 2014. Let me just show you this one right here. Take a look, you can see nine different squares. In every one of these squares, if you look at it carefully, you will see the name of Allah, the name of God, that has been added above the line. In every case, it's been added at a later date above the line of eight of them except for this one here all the eight of them you don't need the name of Allah there why were they added why did they add Allah's name afterwards above a line in a different now this is black and white but if you look in color it's in a different color it's in a different ink it's in a different style of writing the name of Allah had to be added why did it have to be added because for eight of them you don't need it it's understood it's talking about God so why did they add the name Allah in nine different places on the same manuscript? Actually, there's 12 that have been found. In every case, they reason they had to put the name Allah there. They reason they added the name of Allah is because it now agrees with this Hafs text. It now agrees with the standard text. It has now been standardized, which means these have all been censored. These have all been changed so that they agree with the Huff's text. But that's not all they did. They did many other things. Let me give you this one. They did coverings. The Husseini manuscript that Anand Rashid wants us to go back to. If you look at the Husseini manuscript, take a look at that one page. That's just one page of the Husseini manuscript. When you look at that one page, you will see covering after covering after covering. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight eight different coverings on one page and where you see the coverings there's nothing written over top so when you read it it's very difficult to read isn't it in fact it looks just like chicken scratches so why were all these coverings there well once you cover all these up in just one page that which is left over now agrees with this text now agrees with the Huff's text that was canonized in 1985 actually was chosen in 1924. And in every case where you see these erasers, here, let me just show you a case of erasers where they have erased it, not only parts of words, sometimes an entire line, sometimes an entire phrase. These are just 20 that he gave us examples of. Let me just show you one here. Here's an eraser right here. Here you can see where they've erased. We don't know what was written there first. But now that by erasing that, what's left behind now agrees with the Huff's text. When you look over here, I'll just give you another example. Here's an example where they've written an entire line between the line. They've added an entire, almost an entire sentence. 
And because of adding that tire sense, it, it now agrees with the Huff's text. Now, that in, in 2014, he had come up with 800 of these erasers, of these, uh, uh, these uh, uh, erasing with coverings, these coverings with erasing with writings over top, these insertions, all of these he found 800. And so that's what I confronted. I remember confronting Shabirati with this back in 2014. Since 2014, he has now found 4,000 of these corrections. Mm. Corrections means these are done by humans at a later date to standardize the text so that it now agrees with the Huff's text. Now, what Dan Brubaker has done, Yasser Qadi has not yet answered. Neither has Mansur, I'm sorry, Muhammad Hijab. Muhammad Hijabs and the Anand Rashids and the Yasser Qadis and the Shabiradis have yet to talk about the Razm consonantal text. Because once you show that the consonantal text has been changed, no longer can you say the Quran has been preserved. No longer can you say that the Quran even comes from the 7th century. No longer can you say that the Quran even comes from Uthman, let alone that it comes from Muhammad. And what we're showing, what Dan Brubaker is showing by looking at this man, by looking and writing, this is the first book that's ever written anything on this that has been done and published in the world today. And that's why there has been a huge backlash against Dan Brubaker. But two days ago, Dan Brubaker went one step further. And you know about this, David, and I know about him. He and I were up till about 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. He was on the phone to me saying, Jay, how do I do this? I want to, I, I, I want to actually put my first YouTube. Uh, I want to go, go on YouTube. I want to get my first channel up there. So he started his first channel, and it's called Variant Quran. What mm -hmm. a proper name. What a best name to call a, a channel. Variant Quran, V-A-R-I-A-N-T Quran. Go up on YouTube and take a look. Now, do you have it there in front of you? I don't know. I don't have it in front of me. Do you have a looking at Variant Quran? It's only been up for two days. Let me just see. I have, I have a clip from his video. Okay. Go ahead and show the clip while I bring up Variant Quran so I can look and see what, where it's come to it as of right now. Okay, everyone. Let me just uh, to, to give you the – this is from a, a longer video that Dan Brubaker posted on his channel, Variant Quran. But the idea here is – uh, he shows, he, he goes onto a page from Surah 9 of the Quran, and he shows that there was the original writing and that an editor came along later to edit the page, because you can tell it's different, uh, it's different writing, different, uh, so there's editing on the page, but the editor doesn't edit some missing words at the bottom of the page. And so the original writer didn't include these words that are in today's Quran, and uh, the editor who edited the page didn't see a need to uh, add those words or to or, or he just he, he didn't recognize it but looks like an imperfect process so let's go ahead and just watch this short clip of a, of a longer video and and uh, after we're done I'll, I'll add the link to the video to the uh, description here all right here we go and so when we come to the last line of the page this is what uh, the main point that I want to um, illustrate we noticed that the scribe who first wrote the page actually left out three words when it was, if we're comparing it to the text that is now in common use uh, today around the world in the in the Hoff's text and the Cairo edition. So and and that all the traditions point back toward. So, <clears throat> um, so this manuscript is is variant. Not only was it variant at the time of first writing, but the other interesting thing to note and the reason I showed you the other two corrections on the page is that somebody came back to this page at a later time after production and corrected it. And whoever that was, however, did not correct uh, or did not see a need to correct the uh, omission at this spot. So I, th I find that very interesting. So these words uh, stand as they were first written. So two people, at least, uh, well, possibly one of them, made a mistake uh, by omitting something or possibly didn't, possibly thought that that was the way that it was supposed to be written, and possibly the second one, the corrector, either made a mistake and didn't see it, or, uh, once again, reviewed it and thought that that was the way that it was supposed to be written. So I find that interesting. Now, let's take another look, uh, before we finish up here, at the verse itself and read it there. It says, It is the same whether or not you beg forgiveness for them. Though you ask forgiveness for them seventy times, Allah will not forgive them. That is, because they disbelieved in Allah and in his messenger. And that last little bit is cut off, but that's what it says. So, this verse can be read um, sensibly, grammatically correct, with or without the uh, sub-in maratan fa. If you read it without it, it would say, it is the same whether or not you beg forgiveness for them. 
though you ask forgiveness for them, Allah will not forgive them. So that uh, makes sense. But it also makes sense, of course, the way that it uh, stands today. Now, now Jay, uh, let me let me just ask, if, 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 if one manuscript includes 70 times and another manuscript doesn't include 70 times, is that simply a difference in dialect? Or is that something that goes beyond? In other words, is there one dialect of of Arabic where they would say 70 times by being completely silent and then you go speak another Arab uh, Arabic dialect and they say 70 times by actually saying 70 times can you explain this difference in terms of dialect or is this something that goes beyond mere dialectical differences in the manuscripts of the perfectly preserved Quran which there are no variants anywhere because it's been perfectly preserved right down to the letter what, what are your thoughts Obviously, you've answered the question. You're doing it with tongue-in-cheek. Uh, this has nothing to do with dialects. This has nothing to do with Kira'at. This has nothing to do with Ahru. This has nothing to do with uh, different readings. These are completely different words. When you take 70 or you add 70 at a later date, you're actually changing the text. You're actually changing the meaning. And in some cases, you can see that this changes the theology. And that's why... All, you noticed all that da Daniel was, uh, was, uh, was willing to say, isn't that interesting? How many times did he say, isn't that interesting? And that's all he's going to say. He's not in it to actually come to conclusions. We need to come to conclusions. And it's obvious that's just the first. He's going to be putting one or two up every week. He's got 4,000 of these he can put up, 4,000. These are just the simple ones just to get started to help the people along. But if the Muslims are listening, and I hope you're listening, Muslims, this changes the rosum. This changes the skeletal text. This has nothing to do with dots. This has nothing to do with vowels. This has nothing to do with kirat. This has nothing to do with aruf. This is actually our different texts. That is why if Uthman really, if Uthman really was given completely different manuscripts, can you then understand why he had to burn all of them? Because these were completely different readings. These, not readings. These were not. These are completely different sentences different verses. These were different Qurans. And this shows human intervention at the most base level, which destroys any notion that this book has been preserved. Your God did not preserve this book. From the very beginning, he couldn't preserve this book. You can see, I don't know, and what I'd like to know, and what we're doing right now, we have a team that is now getting together. We're looking at all the manuscripts. We're going beyond these changes. We're looking at the text itself. We're looking at the razum after verse by verse. We're comparing the hafs razum, not the kiddot, not the dots. We don't care about the dots. We just want to look at the skeletal text. We're looking at the hafs skeletal text, and we're comparing it with the top copy. We're comparing it with the Matyal. We're comparing it with the Husseini. We're comparing it with all the other major manuscripts. And what we are finding, we're not going to publish it. We haven't gone public with it. But when we go public with it, wait till you see what we're going to show the world. This text, this script, this this uh, Quran has gone through many different derivations. There has been human manipulation from the very beginning. But the question I still want to ask, like I said from the very beginning, notice all these that we're comparing with, with the Huff's text. All the manuscripts that we're comparing to the Huff's text are from the 8th and 9th century. Where is the 7th century Quran? Remember, we're not talking about like the biblical manuscripts, which were written on papyrus. Papyrus disintegrates within 100 years. None of these were written on papyrus. These were written on vellum. These were written on parchment. These were written on animal skins. Those get preserved for thousands of years. So if there were four of these that were written by the caliph, the caliph controlled, by the time that he wrote these, by the time Uthman was in power, he had already controlled from Tripoli all the way to Afghanistan. All that land was under control. He had control of everything. And those cities are still in Islamic control today. And for 1400 years, they've been in Islamic control. Where is there even one of this earliest manuscript? Where is this Uthmanic Quran? Where is the four that were begun at the very beginning? Because we want to look at those four. I don't want to look at fragments, because when you go up on Islamic Awareness website, they have been able to come up, they say now, that they can come up with 96% of the Quran by, the, by 719. That is the 8th century. And when you look and you go up on their Islamic Awareness website, they have 63 different Qurans. None of them are complete. They're just little fragment, a little fragment here, a little fragment here. 63 of these fragments that they've amalgamated together and they are saying that these are all from before 719. Well, we're not talking about 719. I'm talking about 652. Mm -hmm. Who cares about 719? But have you looked at those 63 fragments? 
Do you know if there, any of them have any corrections? And have you even dated those 63 fragments? They haven't even dated them. So where did they get this notion that these are from before 719? Boy, wait till you find out what we're now discovering. I can't introduce it right now, David. That's going to come later because we're still putting it all together. We're still getting the dates on this. But we're going to show you there was no Quran whatsoever from the 7th century. There is no Quran whatsoever from 652. Even the Western scholars like Van Putin, they are just, all they're saying is we talk about a Q Quran. We're talking about a Uthmanic that we would like to think exists, like a Q Bible, a Q Quran. That's all they can talk about, an archetype. But the archetype they're talking about all comes from references from the 9th and 10th century. It's because the 9th and 10th century people said that there was a Quran, that they're saying, well, that must be true. But that's, they don't realize that those are two to three hundred years too late. I don't care about them anymore. I want to go and ask the Muslims. I want you Muslims to tell me, where is this archetype? Where is this Uthmanic recension? Where is this this book that was put together in 652 and four copies made? I would just like to have one. But when you show it to me, it must look just like this. Not the doubts, not the vowels, the razum, the skeletal text must look just like this this. Don't give me the top copy. Don't give me the summer cut. Don't give me the Husseini. Don't give me the, the Sana manuscript. They're all too late. They're all the 8th and 9th century. I want a 7th century Quran. So I ask any Muslim, and I ask Yusuf Qadi this, and I also ask Muhammad Hijab, if you're going to talk about a preserved text, answer me that question. And that's the question I leave with you tonight, because that's going to cause a crisis of faith. And if any Muslims are listening to me, then for heaven's sakes, please, would you stop talking about this preserved text until you can show me a complete text of the Quran, 114 surahs from the time of Uthman. We're not going to listen to you anymore because you don't even know what we found about your prophet Muhammad or what we found about the first four caliphs or what we found about Mecca. Wait till you get to, wait till we get to you and let you know what we found about those ideas. Ooh, that's a whole other area that we've not even got into tonight. But let's stick with the Quran for now. And let's see if, forget about the Kira, that's much too late. I want to talk about the Razm. R-A-S-M. That's the Arabic name. Let's talk about the Razm next time. And don't start talking to me about all these other manuscripts. I don't want to look at them. I want Uthmanic's Razm. Show me where it is. So, uh... You Muslims who are watching, um, we know what you've been told by your leaders. We know that you've been told that it's a miracle of the Quran, perfect preservation, right down to the letter from the time of Muhammad. And you've been told that by all your leaders. They all tell you the same thing. So you assume that your leaders are telling you the truth because obviously they're truthful people who are only going to tell you the, the truth about your religion. And... Much like Yasser Qadi, you have to go outside of Islam to hear any serious challenge to that claim. You don't, you, you don't bring up the serious challenges. You push slightly and then you accept uh, whatever answer you're given. That's what, you, that's what Yasser Qadi says you do, right? The challenges have to come from outside. And interestingly, in that little interview, uh, Yasser, Qadi, Yasser Qadi said that when the, the Western scholars challenge them, he goes, we know they're right. <laughs> they're quoting our sources. We know what they're saying is right. So what he's saying is, we accepted an explanation that does not fit our own sources and the western the western scholars have to point out to us that our explanations do not even fit what our own sources say so he's pointing that out to you so so that that's yasser Qadi talking about the scholarly level but here we are here we are at the level of, of dialogue and conversation and we're telling you that when we go to your sources and when we look to the history of your book uh we find your claim about perfect preservation very strange because we, we read about um, we read about Muhammad telling his followers there are four people that you should learn the Quran from. Those four people couldn't even agree on how many chapters are supposed to be in the Quran. They do not agree with the Quran you have today. Your own Muhammad's own top scholars of the Quran couldn't agree, even according to according to uh, uh, Yasser Qadi. He said that Ubay, Ubay was the master of the Quran. Guess what? In in Sahih Muslim, in Sahih Muslim, Umar, the second of the rightly guided caliph, said Ubay was the best of the reciters. But we have to leave off some of what he recites. He says we have to leave it off. And Ubay replies, "I got this directly from the mouth of Muhammad. I'm not leaving it for anything whatsoever." So there's a dispute amongst Muhammad's own companions on this issue. We read about those things. We read about Abu Musa 
in uh, in Sahih Muslim. Abu Musa saying that he, two entire chapters of the Quran were lost because Muslims were too lazy to recite them. Two entire chapters lost. We we read about uh, more than a hundred verses just being lost from Surah 33 because the people who had those memorized died in battle. We read about verses being eaten by a sheep, and that's all, that's all. Then we get to the then we get to the issue of today, even after Uthman burns all the manuscripts to cover up this giant mess. Even after all of that, you still end up with all kinds of differences, not just in dialect, not just in pronunciation, textual differences. You have Hatun Tash has 37 different Qurans with different Arabic texts, and people try to explain them with some mixture of Ahruf and Kirat and somehow going back. They're trying to explain it all. Do you have any idea how delusional and insane it sounds to look at all that and say, yep, miracle, perfect preservation right down to the letter? The only miracle here. If there were one, if there is a genuine miracle, besides the miracle that you could believe that there is a perfectly preserved Quran, if there is any miracle here, it would be this. The Quran has all the characteristics of a book that has been changed repeatedly, that was yeah. copied and recopied by fallible human beings who made, who made one giant mess. It has all the characteristics of a book that's been changed over and over and over again. If it's been, if if that's miraculous preservation, then then the miracle would be: How can a book have all the features of a book that's been corrupted and not be corrupted? That's your miracle. You're, what you're telling us is the Quran has all the features of a book that's been corrupted, and yet it's perfectly preserved. Well, that would be a miracle indeed. Final thoughts, Jay, and then we can close out. Yeah, I think it's fascinating. I'm thinking as a Christian, listen to all this, and I'm sorry, I'm so glad we have the Bible. My goodness, am I glad we have the Bible. The Bible has already passed every one of these tests, and the Bible doesn't make the claims. We don't make the claims we have about the Bible. Remember, as I said at the very beginning, the Muslims have to say that this book is eternal because the Quran says so in chapter 85, verse 22. The Muslims have to make a claim that this book was sent down to a man named Muhammad between six uh, 10 and 632 for 22 years. The Muslims have to make the claim that this book is complete at the time of Uthman and then sent out to four different cities. The Muslims have to make the claim that this book has never changed in uh, 1400 years. So eternal, sent down, complete, unchanged. Those are the four things they all claim. And I've heard this since, my goodness, since, uh, since the beginning when I was started getting into this in the 1980s. Now, we would never make that claim about the Bible. We would never make those four claims. It is not eternal. It was not sent down complete, but we don't have the originals unchanged. We know where the changes are. We're admitted. We're transparent. We even warn the readers in the Bible. But see, this is not the only word of God that, that we have. Yes, this is the word of God. But there was another word of God, the word of God, the Logos, who took on human form in John chapter one, who entered time and space and dwelt for 33 years amongst us, the word of God. Now, let's ask those four questions about Jesus Christ, because he is the word of God, is he not? Is Jesus Christ eternal? Yes, he is. Was Jesus Christ sent down? Yes, he was. Is he complete? Absolutely. Is he unchanged? Never changes. So the very four things that Muslims have to find for their, uh, uh, their Quran, for their revelation, we find in Jesus Christ. Everything you Muslims are looking for, everything you Muslims need, we've got in Jesus Christ. Come on home. Come on home. We've got what you want. And his name is Jesus Christ. God bless you. It's been great being with you, David. It's been fun. This is the first time we've done this together. We've been on other platforms face-to-face uh, -face there in California and also in Ethiopia. But it's good to finally be with you at your channel. You've done a great job. It's been terrific to see how you've been really bastioning uh, the, the, the church. And you've been really helping us out and defending us and taking Islam up for these many number of years. But God bless you and also you Muslims. You look deep inside you and now realize that your Quran is not eternal. It was not ever sent down. It did not come from Muhammad. It did not come from Uthman. It didn't even come from uh, Abdul Malik. It looks like it was introduced in the 8th and 9th century, changed, as David said, over through the centuries and finally canonized in 1985. Well, that's not a book you can defend anymore. Mm -hmm. Come on back from this book back to this book. Come back to the bigger, the better book. It's bigger for a reason. That's why we keep it nice and big. Come back to the man behind this book. Leave Muhammad. He has. He really didn't do anything. If he didn't, if there was no Quran for him to receive, if there was no Quran to him to pass on, if we now and now it does not come from Muhammad, well then forget that book and come back to this book. But forget that man because then what's the purpose of Muhammad? What's his purpose? If they had nothing to give you, he's not a man to follow. But Jesus is. Come back away from Muhammad. 
back to Jesus. They, listen, look at the God behind this book, Allah. I don't want anything to do with that God. He never comes to earth. He's incapable of taking on human form. He's incapable of having a relationship with me. But Yahweh does. He comes to earth anytime he wants. He was then not at the earth at the very beginning. He was there wrestling with Jacob. He was there in the burning bush. He was there leading the children of Israel through the desert. And he came 2,000 years ago, lived for 33 years, died on the cross and rose again. That's my Jesus. He could be yours as well. Come back to the bigger book, the bigger man. The book is the Bible. The man's Jesus Christ. Thanks, David, for letting me say that. Amen. And uh, good comment to close out with. Uh, Jeffrey Congolo says, uh, remember, there are, <laughs> he said, there are no holes in the narratives. There's a hole full of narratives. <laughs> Did you catch that? Yasser Khadi said there's holes in the narratives. And uh, Jeffrey says there are no holes in the narratives. There's a hole full of narratives. And I think that's that's what you actually have. And uh, you Muslims who are watching, uh, I just encourage you to, to think seriously about this, right? Your leaders all told you perfect preservation right down to the letter. And you can see even from people like Yasser Khadi and, and uh, Shabir Ali admitting it now, that's false. And you don't need to go to them. You could go to your sources. You could go to the manuscripts. You can find out that it's totally, completely false. The big question that should be bothering you right now, instead of attacking us, the big question that should be bothering you is, if my leaders lied to me about that, what else have they lied to me about? And why should I be trusting them? Maybe I need to investigate this for myself instead of blindly, mindlessly uh, agreeing with anything they say. So I'll leave you with that. I'm told by Sam Shimon to tell everyone that he's got a live stream that's starting after us. Uh, I can't advise everyone to go over to that unless you have trouble sleeping. If you have trouble sleeping, if you have insomnia, then I, I, I can tell you that Sam is going to have a live stream right after ours. And if you need to be cured of your insomnia, you can go to Sam's, uh, Sam's channel and you'll be instantly cured and be able to sleep like a little baby. Thanks, Jay, for joining me. We'll catch you all. You. Catch you all next time. Bye bye.